él, Fernando, para que vayamos. Eh, digo, no sé. Yo me pongo en una esquinita. Sí. ¿no? Vale, cógete. Arracha León, voy a hacer mi presentación en euskera. I'm going to deliver my presentation in the Basque language, uh, just in case you don't have the headsets. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to you all to this first um, uh, seminar on the International Symposium that's going to take place on July the 9th and 10th at the Azcuna Centro. And I have uh, sitting next to me Miren Jayo, Lady Arcadete, and uh, the this is a project of the Azcuna Centra in collaboration with uh, Bolegua ZB that we initiated in uh, 2016 and which will close in another two years. And uh, this is a relationship that was established in 2013 with Bolegua as a as a resident uh, collective and uh, this uh, is a medium midterm contract so we set up a reading group in the first year which in 2014 gave rise to an exhibition and also to a program full of activities uh, with lectures and with another reading group with performances and a film cycle etc and which finished in 2015 with the publication of a book and then on the other hand uh, the exhibition itself well this is a collaboration um, project between las cunas and bulegua this is a project that kicked off in the year 2016 and it has uh, had uh, several public events. It had an introduction in September 2016 and two international encounters. One of them took place in 2017 and this other one that I have the honor of uh, inaugurating here in July 2019. And the purpose of the project is uh, to study uh, specific exhibitions that took place between the year 1977 and 2017. And, uh, each international event focuses on two decades and uh, in the introduction we mentioned some of the key elements of this exhibition and its connection with the concept of uh, a rehearsal. So we took two dates that covered uh, four decades and in one extreme we had 2017 which is the year that represents the present and then the other year is in 1977, which, uh, according to Franco Berardi, before, uh, represents uh, the after the future that was uh, influenced uh, by the implementation of the post-industrial society and uh, the exhaustion of modernity. So I would like to remind you that this new project that we started some time ago is going to be focused on the decade um, 27, 2017, and we are going to have uh, Joaquín Ruiz de Castrovejo, Inés Xavier, Raquel Weiss, Aymar Arriola. We also have Catherine Davis and Corian Diserens with us. And now I'm going to um, point out the names of our guests, the people that have been working with us uh, in uh, this uh, exhibition. In September, we had the contribution made by Aurora Fernández Polanco, Luca Frey, 
Carlos Sacagnini and Joe Fernandez at the end of the first encounter of September the 2017th. We had the contributions of uh, Leal Getier, Duran Garcia, Carles Serra, Tamir Tamara Vientinga, Morsa Nakunski, Franco Grifo, and Bernardi. But I would also like to say that this year we've also um, had a number of uh, presentations on different exhibition examples that took place within this uh, period of time and at different locations in the world. And uh, these uh, presentations have been received through an open call that the Afguna Centro published a few months ago and uh, as a support to this project. And this symposium is aimed at all those people that are interested, especially artists and curators, historians, uh, art historians, uh, critics, um, designers and students of fine arts, the history of art, design, architecture and sociology, among other things. And I would like to underscore that this symposium comes under the programme project or that, that I presented a few months ago at the Earth Kuna Central. And uh, I'm suggesting this, this is not a strategic plan, but this is rather a proposal that we're making and it's a way of focusing on our mission and of also setting goals according to the lines of work that we'll be drafting in this five-year period. I would like to remind you that this new program is based on a completely new approach, uh, that is, uh, with uh, society and contemporary culture. It's going to be a new vision to become a connector, to have an influence on this context and also um, build a much more creative, uh, critical and diverse society. And we also have a new mission, and that is that we have to um, make it possible for Azcuna Centro to become a diverse public space as well as a benchmark in terms of uh, contemporary culture at a local and international level through five strategic lines that are the following. Firstly, through the program at our centre, the Azcuna Centro has to be open and connected, in other words, from the local to the international, with a new approach uh, focused on the users and by reconsidering their experiences and new audiences too, so that we can hold conversations with them and also have the positive improvements in our internal actions. So we have six uh, lines in our program, contemporary art, uh, live arts, um, cinema and audiovisual, society, digital culture and uh, literature. And uh, also education and mediation as uh, strategic pillars. And with a new archive as a repository of what we're doing, but also as a tool for creation and mediation. And we want to give value to all spaces. And finally, and I'm not going to say much more, I would like to thank all of the people that have uh, assisted us and those of you that are here today. And in particular, many thanks to the speakers that have come to the Azcuna Centra and uh, which, uh, who will be sharing their knowledge and their expertise. And I hope that this will be as fruitful as possible for you. And I'm now going to give the floor to um, Bolleroy so that they can explain the dynamics of this new um, symposium. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Fernando, for that uh, introduction. And uh, we would like to take the opportunity to, well, to uh, we'll cover some of the things that Fernando has already mentioned. We would like to thank Azcuna Centro for the support they've given us since 2013, which is when the collaboration started between us and the Azcuna Centro. And uh, in those days it was called Alondiga, and now it's Azcuna and Alondiga, so it's both things really, I suppose. And for us, the support that was uh, given to us uh, was extremely important. But it's not only support, though. It's also um, the coverage and the trust that they have in us to carry on with this work. First, uh, with the contract, which is a very long uh, contract, a long project, rather, and which has allowed us to get many things done since 2016 with uh, the papers of the exhibition. So thank you very much uh, for trusting us. And I would also like to thank all of you people that have come this afternoon, although it's a nice sunny day. Yes, it is sunny today outside. It's lovely. But in any case, I'm going to be very brief in the presentation because it's going to be a very intense afternoon. And uh, it's, uh, well, it's going to be two intense days, in fact, in this program. When, well, subsequent to what Fernando was pointing out about this uh, contract that was a very long project and which ended with an exhibition, 
and we were very happy with it because we believed that it was very significant for our track record and this was thanks to the support provided by Ascuna and we were wondering what kind of interests there were in this uh, issue of uh, the curatorial action that was very fashionable there were lots of symposia and there were lots of courses too so as regards uh, our concerns we decided to consider these ideas and these concerns and submit a new project and uh, fortunately, fortunately, we were supported, and that's why we are here today. And as we have uh, a way of working in the long term, and as we do things very slowly, and as we gradually cover different stages, we proposed something that uh, from the very beginning was divided into four separate stages, which are the four decades that we've already spoken about, and that uh, well, we also included a prologue. And this proposal had a conceptual framework which has to do with the heading that you already know, which is the papers of the exhibition, and it's two cultural forms, that of the papers and that of the exhibition itself. And uh, the papers, well, this uh, has two meanings. We have uh, experiments and uh, mm, we have uh, the text, uh, this reflective text uh, in relation to a specific issue. And the other cultural approach has to do with uh, what brings us here today, which has to do with the exhibition, which is apparently a much more static concept that we all have very clear in our minds. And it's a, usually a public um, exhibition that takes place at a given location, but history has demonstrated, and especially the experience of recent decades, that it's not that easy, that it's much more complex than we believe, and that it um, is full of ambiguities and complexities as uh, occurs uh, with the papers themselves. So our proposal was, let's try to um, have a retrospective, or let's try to do a review, and let's um, um, cover a number of exhibitions that we believe are significant uh, due to a number of reasons, and we're going to try to uh, understand the exhibition as if it were a text, or as if it were a discursive um, um, process, in relation to other texts that are sometimes inside and outside the exhibition and based on these uh, connections between the papers and between the different exhibitions we decided to um, suggest a uh, format or a structure that is also related to how these exhibitions were staged and where this uh, notion comes from and this is why we have the four decades that uh, um, uh, Fernando has uh, spoken about very briefly too and which range from 1977 and 2017. And when we came across this uh, proposal, it was the future, but it's no longer the future because we've uh, gone slower than what we initially believed with the design, but it's still the present. And uh, 1977 was a year when, well, uh, where there were lots of uh, political changes taking place and that there was also um, a crisis in uh, modern uh, storytelling and there was a crisis of modernity, in other words, a number of very significant social changes. And uh, before, before was here at the first um, meeting and that was the year that marked the after the future, which is what Fernando pointed out too. So we were using that and we liked it because it took us to the local environment of what we're going to be talking about in this decade that has to do with the fact that in 1977 the Guggenheim Museum was opened and uh, this is uh, will show uh, the diverse social changes that um, have taken place all over the world with the convergence and the emergence of new models of museums related to new global economies and tourism which is something that we're going to be able to talk about here. So within this conceptual framework of the papers and the exhibition and with this uh, period of 40 years this is how we addressed this, uh, these papers and as Fernando pointed out we also made an introduction to see where we stood and then we focused on 1977 to 1987 and now we're moving on to the second decade from 1987 to 97 and I'm going to allow my colleagues to speak now Thank you very much uh, Fernando and Bear. Well, the uh, truth is that what I'm going to do now is I'm going to be talking about the conceptual framework of this period, of this decade, and then Lide 
will introduce the structure and she will also present our guests and so on and so forth. And the decade that we're going to be analysing has uh, very special contents. Uh, well, all the other decades are very special, of course. They are very interesting. But in order to understand where it is we stand at this point in time, this uh, decade uh, from 1987 to 1997 is uh, a definitive decade. Because on the one hand, it's uh, not uh, very far away from the present, and we the say say that it's uh, distant. So this uh, feeling that I have can be found in how fast changes have taken place. And just to mention a couple of events that date back to that decade, we could uh, mention how in the year 1989, for instance, uh, the Berlin Wall um, was pulled down. And that's what gave rise to the neoliberal approach. And then there's another event that took place in that decade, the term the internet for most of us was a pretty obscure concept but nowadays it is something that is known by practically everybody and um, economy became hegemonic although we don't know very much about economy and uh, in relation to this There was a, a crisis in the concept of the uh, nation state, although in the Spanish state, uh, people were very enthusiastic because we'd uh, joined uh, NATO very recently. We were also going to join the European community, etc., etc. But as regards the artistic system in those years, They, they began to structure this political economic system. For instance, at this uh, Centro Alondiga, where we are sitting today, that's where, this is where museums and exhibition, art exhibition centers were opened that were going to crop up all over the place, that would eventually crop up all over the place, as if they were mushrooms. and uh, as well as the biennials that already existed. But the contemporary art was going to be the main letter, but that was going to give um, rise to many new biennials. And uh, the prices uh, for contemporary works of art were going to reach the same levels as um, classical works of art. Meaning that uh, an instrumentalization was going to take place in the field of art. So as Sojuth said, art and culture were going, to be used, were going to be used as from that moment as if they were resources. And this instrumentalization was going to be developed through the um, was going to become um, art was going to become a commodity it was also going to be connected to um, low the low cost concept and this obviously now brings us to this context context we're f currently facing because in the basque context and in the bilbao context uh, we're talking about the bilbao effect it was going to become a paradigm and uh, as uh, we are in Bilbao since uh, 1987 until today, the um, Bilbao landscape has been transformed completely. I'd say that there's been a dramatic um, transformation. 
all you have to think is about this place in 1987. What was there here in 1987? Here there was an old building that was completely neglected and locked up. And there was also a project to build a contemporary art centre that had been designed by the sculptor Jorge Ortega, but it was never carried out. And then in 2010, many of you, well, I suppose that lots of you are possibly not aware of the fact that it was opened in 2010, but in any case, the approach they used was completely different. And I've already mentioned that the landscape of Bilbao in 2010, no, sorry, in 1987 to 1997, in 1997 is when the Guggenheim Museum was um, opened, and that's when the Bilbao effect cropped up. And by the way, here in the Basque country, they call it the Guggenheim effect. But in any case, before the Bilbao effect, Many other things happened before that uh, occurred that had to do with the art because we already had an artistic fabric. So that is why at this seminar we've uh, focused uh, much more on uh, the local context than what we did at the previous uh, meeting. So. Of the six uh, conferences, three of them are related to the local context, and there's another issue that has to do with the previous encounters, which is the following. At the previous event, most of our guests, or most of the people that were invited, um, delivered their own version. But here we have um, first-hand witnesses. These are people that um, knew what this was like. And uh, they uh, have been uh, players and still are players in the artistic system. So what I mean to say is that we're going to be touching upon a number of different subjects. But uh, Richard Joaquin Vázquez and Neymar Arriola are sitting here with us today. And they're going to be talking about the instrumentalization of uh, art as a political representation. And we'll also see how art and how life or how the social and the political phenomena. We will see what kind of response art has, or up to what extent art can respond to these social and political changes. And we'll also be talking about the um, contemporary art concept that was up and running at that time. And we'll be looking at uh, all of this from different angles. And, uh, for instance, uh, well, Richard Wace was uh, deeply involved in this field, and we'll see how we'll be talking about different categories, about the centre, about the periphery, um, the contemporary things, the primitive things. Uh, we're going to discuss all of these issues. And ultimately, we'll see what it is we can see if we look uh, back, if we look at the past. So this is the line of connection that we want to establish between the previous uh, meetings and this one. Thank you very much, Medin. I would now like to introduce uh, the um, guest we have this afternoon. I would also like to say something about the structure of this first day of our program. We're going to kick off with a presentation that's going to be delivered by Amar Ariola, And he's going to be talking about the HIV AIDS uh, crisis. And I would like to point out that this uh, presentation takes as a starting point the year 1977, which is uh, the first decade that we've set for this um, meeting. And it was at the time when AIDS, AIDS uh, became a cultural object, especially in relation to the aesthetic uh, debate that uh, cropped up in um, um, one of the special numbers of the October magazine where they addressed the issue between uh, death and AIDS. And um, Aymar Ariola is a curator, he's also an editor and a researcher. He's uh, just read his uh, thesis 
at the University of London. And I would also like to say that he's organized uh, many exhibitions and many public uh, programs at uh, outstanding um, institutions like uh, MACBAC and the Centro Centro in Madrid, the Museum of Fine Arts in uh, Bilbao and Tabacalera in San Sebastian. And together with Nancy Garin and Linda Valdez, he's also um, carried out a project at the archives. So after Aymar Arriola's uh, presentation, and we'll have a, just a few minutes for questions, we'll give the floor to Rachel Weiss, who will present her presentation called Regional Globalism and how the Havana Biennial redefined the debate. And Rachel will be talking about the exhibition logics and discursive logics of the third biennial in Havana that took place in the year 1989. And uh, her presentation will focus on analyzing the challenges that have to do with contemporary art, which uh, in a way were proposed by this biennial. And she'll be um, questioning the uh, Eurocentrism of contemporary art. And Rachel Weiss is an educator, she's a writer, and uh, she has also worked as a curator. And right now she's a teacher at the Arts Administration and Policy at the Art Institute of Chicago. She's also published, um, extensively published uh, papers on contemporary art, on journals and newspapers in the United States, in Europe, in Latin America, in Asia and Australia. And amongst her main publications, we have, for instance, Making Art Global and the third Havana Biennial that was published by After All Books. And then there's another work or two, and From Utopia and the New Cuban Art, published by the University of Minnesota Press. Or, well, just to mention one final work uh, for America, the work of Juan Francisco Elso, published by the National Autonomous University of Mexico. And we'll also have a few minutes uh, left at the end of her presentation to address uh, any questions. And we'll be finishing this afternoon, we'll be finishing with this afternoon's presentations with the lecture that's going to be given by Joaquin Vázquez Ruiz de Castro Viejo. His uh, presentation is entitled The Imperative Dream, ETA plus Ultra. And he's going to be talking about uh, political practices in 1992. And he will talk about the uh, production company based in Sevilla. And uh, he started to work in the field of contemporary art in 1991 with these two exhibitions. Well, 1991 with El Sueño Imperativo and with uh, Plus Ultra in 1992. And these are two projects that he carried out together with Mar Villaspesa. And I would also like to say that Joaquin Vázquez Ruiz de Castrovejo is a founding member of uh, Benigüe Producciones. And from 2001 to 2015, he coordinates the program of the International University of Andalusia. In 2006, he was also involved in the platform of cultural policies of uh, Seville. And uh, at uh, BNV, well, Joaquin has uh, organized many projects. Among them, just to mention only a few of them, Cien por Cien, Almadraba, Reflexiones sobre el exilio, el fantasma y el esqueleto, el ir y venir de Valcarce Medina, desacuerdo, etc., etc. And I would also like to say that after the presentations, we'll have a conversation with Joaquín, well, with all three uh, guest speakers that uh, Madrid, uh, Gabriel, and myself will chair. And before giving the floor to Aymar Arriola, what I would like to say is that from 11 to 2 at this, in this room, well, there are going to be six contributed papers that we have received through a, an open call. And I would just like to read out to you the names of the authors of these contributed papers and their titles so that you can come along tomorrow. We have Alejandro Alonso Diaz, who will present a paper called Taxidermia in El Jardín de la Den, Revision of the Medicina de la Tien, and from 1989. And we also have Maya Sanchez that's going to be presenting El Tropezo, Desapariciones e Imprevisibility, a propósito de Caja Zapatos Vacía en Aperto, 1993. Anita Orces, who will present Más allá de la Exposición, Cruces de Camino entre Bienales, between 1999 and 19, 1989 and 1993, will be presenting a lecture in the past, in English, sorry, presenting the past, 
Sao Paulo in 1998. The Sierra Portia will present two exhibition, uh, two lectures on AIDS, AIDS timeline, group material 1990, I think she said. And every week there is something different. Uh, and finally, Marion Cruz Livian will present um, this, or both de la Ficción, and this is an exhibition that took place in 1995 at several institutions. So without further ado then, let's give the floor now to our friend Aymar Arrola. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you to all of you for uh, coming. I'm going to make my presentation in Spanish. And I'm worried about uh, deadlines. So without any further ado, I'm going to get to the crack of the matter and also also, I request the organizer to sort of let me know when I only have like uh, 30 minutes to go and 15 minutes uh, to go because, as I've said, I'm very concerned about the time. I've been invited to talk from the perspective of the uh, AIDS uh, crisis in the 80s. This is a subject that sort of occupied an important part of my work in the last uh, years by means of different initiatives like the project already mentioned and Archivo SIDA developed since 2012 with Nancy Green and Linda Valdez. That was my uh, doctoral thesis and also the project Marginalia that I developed in between 2012 and 2013. Starting point for it was the uh, personal library of uh, Pepe Spaliu that he uh, gave to Ortelago before he uh, died precisely due to issues related to AIDS. And then I, in the second part of my conference, I will give you further details on this event. Well, here you see uh, the uh, library in Ortelago uh, by Pepe Spaliu. And then we have, it's been published in the Azir Mendizabal's uh, publication, and it was done about 2002 at the time of the reopening of Ortoleco and the uh, starting point with uh, the photographic archive of Ortoleco so far. I am uh, HIV negative, and this is why often I have to answer why I invested seven years of research on the art implications and cultural implications of AIDS. Well, uh, the uh, possible answer is complex, like everything in life, and here we have things related to my own life, my visual education, hazard, and a bacterial peritonitis, acute one, that I suffered more than 10 years ago that took all me, uh, almost uh, killed me, and uh, then I decided to give up my job as assistant curator at the Guggenheim High Museum in Bilbao, and uh, doing so, I sort of stopped with the social contract that we were leading my life so far, and I think this was a major Maybe aiming at searching a new job or a new uh, to follow a new path that would feel more like my own. So for two years, I studied at the MACBA, and we did a collective research about the collective production uh, during the uh, democratic uh, transition in the Spanish uh, state. And then this was at the same time at uh, the apparition of the AIDS. And we neglected at the time the impact of uh, AIDS on uh, uh, culture. This is why we decided to sort of uh, devote ourselves to studying this subject matter. So with this, what I want to say is that when I approach this uh, cultural archive, about eight is from a certain distance, from a cluster of uh, distances. And this is what I mean by the title of my conference, to see from a distance. So basically, this is about uh, letting you know where I am and why I am standing when I am talking, and also letting you uh, know that I'm not the witness or the main character of this uh, subject that I am talking about. And now I'm going to skip uh, all the way through up until page number three. So I'm going to skip a preamble that I prepared for my conference. 
I don't want to revisit again the uh, AIDS uh, crisis. I think this is a phenomenon that sort of uh, describes all the different uh, art uh, and research and cultural production that took place uh, in the last years. Uh, and this has been done by a new generation of uh, researchers and artists that are sort of uh, looking to this uh, complex uh, period of time where it is difficult to tell the difference between nostalgia and uh, the memory. And also, we have also sometimes um, tendency to sort of uh, just think of uh, something that we lived in the past in a different way, not like it was. And this is a vision of uh, two uh, artists that with some humor are trying to sort of uh, put an end to this revisitation of the AIDS uh, crisis. So the conference is going to have two parts. The first one is going to be more scholar, and uh, then I'm going to briefly mention two uh, things about the uh, AIDS it's a, a crisis, uh, and uh, from a distance, we'll see it uh, with some uh, clarity. First of all, I'll tackle the uh, prior, prior periodization of AIDS, uh, that is, we identify AIDS to a specific period of time, and then art and uh, AIDS, uh, something that sort of gives a meaning to how we do the reading of specific uh, experiences, how the uh, artist Pepe Espaliu with the exhibition that took place in uh, Artaleco during that summer. And uh, here we see some of the uh, images by Ricardo Iriarte, one of the 45 that were chosen in order to talk about this uh, action. This is number seven with Gemma uh, Inchausti and Jose Ramona Mondarain with the espalio. So this was about taking the artist's uh, body that uh, meant uh, he was ill, and there was a human chain of uh, people, in, uh, and they were taking this uh, sick uh, person, the artist, around the uh, downtown Donostia. This was the first time that uh, this uh, subject matter was tackled. And then later on, I will give you further details about this. Then some would like to underline the relationship in between the 8 and the 80s. And this series of uh, problems that I'd like to mention here, given the framework of our gathering here, framework that sort of responds to a clear period of time and the to eight uh, crisis, we always sort of assign some specific uh, time uh, crisis. So, Usually, we only talk about two decades, the 80s and the 90s, for this AIDS uh, crisis. And this seems that it is something of the past, as we all now should know. There's not still an um, efficient uh, vaccine again, the uh, transmission of HIV. And according to UN, UNS AIDS, 20, in 2017, 36.9 million people lived in the world uh, with that uh, virus, and 1.8 million people uh, got the infection that year. And in Bilbao, nowadays, living with the HIV doesn't mean that you died, you are uh, transmitted. But in other contexts, this is not the case. And not only in other national uh, frameworks, imagine as underdeveloped, like in Chile last year, it was a national emergency, the HIV, because there were many Many more people getting infected, and also there were some new therapies that were updated. This is why this uh, crisis sort of goes on. So, if we create a problem of the identification of the AIDS and the uh, decade of the 80s, it's not only urgent, but it's also a way to see the new way how we are sort of penalizing AIDS. And also consider there is a lineal time for AIDS, and this is the main part of the recent uh, work of revisiting AIDS. And this, we have a casual uh, image of my desk uh, some years ago at home in London, and it, here we have this lineal uh, time in relation to AIDS with two pieces of work, a four in paper work by Felix Gonzalez with some benchmarks uh, in between 1983 and 1999. They're not consecutive, but on top of it, there is a postcard 
of uh, 2017 by the uh, Native American uh, artist Damien Dine Jesse. I am uh, HIV positive since uh, 1492. And in his work, he uh, considers that AIDS uh, goes beyond the uh, white colonialist imperialism. So revisiting in this uh, present uh, context, AIDS, it's more and more difficult to talk about one AIDS on one AIDS uh, crisis. There are multiple crises of AIDS, uh, and these vary according to different, the different impact of the HIV. We cannot talk about a global chronology of AIDS either, and the typical period of the crisis organized in decades, and according to the progression of events, it's maybe limited. So here I also wanted to show a recent image. This is a sticker by the writer, friend, and artist Theodore uh, Kerr that in the last year he's been doing an artwork and of uh, writing and reconstruction of the live uh, story of Robert Redford, an Afro-American teenager, heterosexual from St. Louis, Missouri, that died due of a weird disease in 1969. And since 1987, he, it is known that he died due to issues related to HIV. So for 30 years, uh, we already know that the HIV crisis is there and was there before our time. Well, what I mean with this uh, idea, and many other people are also suggesting by revisiting the AIDS uh, crisis, is that maybe it is uh, about high time to recognize uh, that there was AIDS before AIDS itself, and that the story of AIDS is not the story of HIV, but the story of our responses to this uh, crisis. And this leads me to my second uh, um, matter, and that is the relationship in between art and aid uh, as a unit of uh, meaning. Like in this uh, carrying of Spaliu, the day after it was uh, shown in the Ario de Thesis, and it was uh, the main uh, title in the front of page. So AIDS has been treated by uh, art, and this is an idea that appears in a precise historical context. And uh, this happened in 1987, a date that sort of sets uh, the decade that so, sort of uh, tell, makes us uh, talk about this uh, subject matter here. So this is when the uh, American activist and essayist Douglas Cream that died last Friday, he characterized the question of art and aid. He talked about the limited forms and maybe contradictory of aid and art and how they have been relation, relating to each other during that decade. So this monography, as already mentioned, is a must read for anybody that would like to do research on aid because this is the first context, the first time when there was a debate, uh, aesthetic debate about AIDS. So in this issue of October, this is important because Crimp uh, attempted to start a debate about the role of the cultural production in times of historical emergency. This was already what we see in the title, AIDS, uh, to point cultural analysis, cultural activism. And this is the image of the uh, book that was published a year after the magazine showed this uh, article because this issue was uh, very important. And then also in Spain, we sort of uh, echo this uh, publication with uh, uh, Amor y Rabia published uh, in Spain. In 1993, this is an early attempt to see what is the relationship in between art and AIDS. So Krim's analysis in that uh, publishing house, October, sort of uh, focuses on the first 10 years of the AIDS and typifies two uh, useful responses uh, to AIDS from the world of art. Basically, initiatives decide to collect uh, fans like auctions and collective exhibitions to get money to, for scientific research with uh, social organizations uh, support. And then the second is the uh, pieces of art that sort of show the loss and the human suffering. So that is the art uh, reduced as uh, good 
to be sold and also as a way to show suffering. So he Krimpt uh, gives example of different responses like uh, uh, charity exhibitions, solitary works, uh, plays, paintings. So this is about the relationship in between AIDS and homosexuality and about the uh, natural trend of homosexual towards art. According to Krimp analysis, this initiative responded to an idealist consumption and transcendental of the art that separated the aesthetic production from the social engagement. So uh, an example is close to us about this kind of response uh, from the world of art to AIDS, according to one of the two typifications by Krimp that I usually uh, mention because he's not very well known. It is the first exhibition of art uh, uh, to fight AIDS that was organized by the uh, Association of the Press in San Sebastian in the fall of 1902 with the support of the uh, Department of Culture and Health of the Basque government. This exhibition opened under the uh, logo of uh, give him your hand, shake his hand, it's okay. And then five people were posing in front of the Miramar uh, Palace. This took place in October 1992 after the carrying. So here we see Pepe Espaliu and John Salabaria together with uh, Gaspar Montez Iturriaz, Irene Lafitte, and Eduardo Chida behind. So AIDS reactivated, as Krem said, in October internationally. The apparently uh, solidarity and engagement of different uh, uh, artists like Chigida that in the 70s and 80s uh, were fighting for different social causes. So the uh, newspaper El Mundo also mentioned, I am a human being, and the least I can do is to help. And this is how Chiyida contributed to this uh, fight. For Krim, uh, an alternative model in this uh, relationship was the activist group uh, founded in New York in 1997, ACT UP. And here we see an image of the first intervention of ACT UP in an uh, art uh, space in the uh, show window that was also the cover of the book. Grimp would give some examples of engaged art uh, practices and in his aesthetic political uh, practices he would also include that artists uh, participating in ACTA would have would run in parallel a more conventional participation in the system of art. They, many of them would sort of uh, display or show their art in galleries and museums at the same time. But to crimp uh, the fact that many artists uh, would uh, be part of ACTA fighting AIDS, uh, this will sort of alter the relationship of the artists with the system of art or the art establishment, especially uh, when uh, questioning the places where art will be uh, displayed and this alleged uh, sort of uh, consciousness about uh, the uh, use of art. Here I cannot uh, assess uh, how Krimt was sort of assessing the good uh, things that ACTAP was doing. I cannot sum up either all the different uh, works that were revisited internationally since uh, at least 2012. Uh, at the time of the 20th, uh, 25th anniversary of the creation of this group, a movement that could be sort of considered as one of the ones uh, um, starting the revisiting of this AIDS uh, crisis. As Alejandra Juas uh, mentioned uh, recently and occasionally a member of ACTAP in New York, every time ACTAP is uh, remembered uh, time and time again as the pinnacle of modern uh, activism, other places of response to AIDS are forgotten. But, and I add, that in the history of ACTAB, this is not only about an hegemonic uh, memory that sort of shadows other experiences, uh, but it's also about some also another stories that are not well known about that will explain, for example, the presence of t-shirts or uh, caps of ACTAB in Artelec or the activity of ACTAB uh, in Barcelona. This is an informal division of the group that uh, worked in between 1991 and 1995 in Barcelona. And that was one of the three cases of a study that we recently presented in the last exhibition of this Anarchivo Sida in the Macba. 
Okay, you see some images of that ex exposition or exhibition. Uh, nevertheless, the situation of Krim in 1987 and uh, all responses of AIDS from the world of art uh, go through the idealization of the trust sentence, and also the suggestion in this very same issue of October that the cultural work around AIDS can also be done from sensitivity of a specific of a cultural specificity. This uh, take me to the second part of my conference, and then I can also introduce an artistic experience where many of the questions of sort of uh, class uh, to be here uh, will echo. That is the workshop by the artist Pepe Espaliu in Arteleco. I'm not a specialist in Espalio. My work on Espalio is focused on his last uh, practice, especially in the experience in his workshop in Arteleco and actions uh, derived uh, from the same, and also about uh, the other actions uh, coming out of this workshop, like when he gave uh, his legacy to the library in Arteleco or when the current society, a uh, collective identity that was created and also the current sort of uh, happened under the framework of this uh, workshop. And then uh, later on, up until 1998, there was a uh, group of, uh, that undertook different activities after these ideas. Here we see an image done by an original Polaroid with the uh, um, well-known image of the group. And I've got to say that it is quite funny that precisely in the archive of Arteleco, this uh, image uh, can only be there under a license, uh, under the uh, copyright license. For years, Arteleco was the lady of the uh, precisely all this uh, talk or debate about copyright. And then there was this uh, Karen society that sort of aimed at uh, uh, questioning some things like the uh, propri propriety, uh, property or the uh, who is the author of a piece of work. So here I'm not showing this as a counter model uh, for uh, foreign groups like ACTAB, even though the current experience sort of uh, is in line of these ideals of collective work and aesthetic engagement and social orientation. The experience of the Spelly workshop and uh, the three collective action that took place uh, there responded to very specific uh, conditions of time and place uh, granted by Arteleco and also uh, due to the social climate that were difficult to reproduce or imitate. So this makes it very difficult to sort of uh, conceive uh, these uh, work in the workshop of Arteleco like a motor. And here I show an image of the collective action, Jenkoa Bak et Taberanaikoa. So what is left about the idea of God, that was one of the three actions uh, that took place uh, after this workshop. And on the first stage, it was a series of uh, public interventions in Donostia. And this was uh, after the correlation suggested by Espalio in between different organs of the body and the city itself. That is a photography that you see by Ricardo Iriar, the documented intervention of uh, uh, the man that was at the time the uh, firehouse uh, man in Igeldo, representing skin. So here I call upon this experience of the workshop of Espaliu, and with this I want to show the difficulties of seeing from a distance. So I see, I uh, show here how your own gaze, uh, when you uh, review a uh, history sort of with alter reality, and this is at the very basis of the uh, crisis of, of the revisitation of the AIDS uh, crisis. So I curated in uh, between 2012 and 2013 an exhibition called Marginalia, and the starting point for it was the personal library of Espelio that was uh, given, as I've told, as I've told you uh, previously. Uh, to Arteleco before, before he died. So now we see how we revisit this uh, project of revisitation. In uh, 
2012-2013 it was the 20th anniversary of the holding of this uh, workshop uh, of Vespalinar Teleco, and some, it was also the 20th anniversary of his death when he was only 37 years old. And about uh, this event, different initiatives uh, were being organized in Spain to pay homage to these artists and to remember this uh, homage, uh, these artists. And uh, this was not just to sort of uh, pay homage, but rather to urgently reconsider the centrality of Espelio and the Karen within the recent art history in Spain, and specifically about different responses uh, from the world of culture and art uh, to the uh, crisis of AIDS and HIV. And this was then uh, also taken into account his personal library. From a methodological perspective, this project was divided into two sections. One had to do with research work that I did with the archives, and one year later it gave rise to a documental exhibition at the Coldo Michelina Center, and you can see two pictures of this exhibition and a couple of uh, presentations and an academic text and an invitation for several artists so that they could uh, develop specific uh, exhibitions based on the library with uh, Antonio Galeno, Pablo Marto, and Susana Talayero. And at that time, 2012-2013, that's when the Artelecu was closed down. And in the early months of 2011, it was uh, announced that the Provincial Council of Iquipota and the Future International Centre of uh, Contemporary Culture, Tabacalera, had um, signed a collaboration agreement to implement the Tabacalera project based on the services and lines of actions that were in place at Artelecu. And I would like to say that this happened before the cultural management of uh, Tabacalera was uh, done, which wasn't until 2012, and I would like to praise them. And this so-called convergence plan gave rise to a three-year transition period for the co-management of Artelecu until it was transplanted into Tabacalera, where Artelecu was going to become its um, lung or heart. And these initial convergence plans uh, took as a central issue the evolution of the documentation center in its uh, progression towards the Tawakarera Center. So in other words, the bibliographic and videographic and uh, archive of Artelejo was to be taken to Tabacalera in order to provide the core of the future uh, Tabacalera Center, which, you know, has not been the case, or it was only carried out in part. And here you have a general view of the Arteleco Library after it was re-inaugurated in 2002 with the Pepe Spaliu Library up at the top of the picture, and another two pictures. Well, this was uh, an event that I'm not going to be able to refer to, which uh, was the flooding of uh, November 2011. In other words, months before the Marginalia project was initiated and uh, the Artelecu library was flooded and this affected, affected the facilities very severely. And well, with the exception of the Espaliu uh, library. So in the evolution plans of the documentation center of Tarekwu, it seems that there was a foreign body that was very difficult to adapt because of its uh, unique uh, character. And this uh, foreign body was the Pepe Espaliu library. And this uh, reflected his um, hobbies and his studies. And in this library, you can find 4,500 uh, volumes on art, uh, philosophy, literature, but also on gardening, on travels, on gay culture, magic, or homeopathy, which seem to be unsuitable subjects for a um, center of this kind of the 21st century. But I wanted to investigate this library, but uh, the, the knowledge that I already had accelerated the process. So one of the non-declared objectives of my project as such and one of its hidden agendas was to try to stop the dismantling of the library as regards her being a um, strange object in the Artelecu archive. And I had many motivations. And for instance, there were biographic issues and an interest in books. And in my interest uh, for the Espaliu library, I was feeling very nostalgic and I also had a feeling of responsibility because I have no effective uh, ties with Artelecu. I did not participate in the so-called outstanding Artelecu decade in between 1994 and 99, which is when I studied fine arts at the Leyo University. 
I only remember having participated in one of the Artebeku training activities in a particular seminar entitled Pop No Art, coordinated by Gabriel Villota and Frat Lagar in October of 97, which uh, well could uh, be, well, we could talk about that at a different lecture. And now, in hindsight, they were offering me powerful elements of identification that uh, would obviously influence my adult subjectivity. And it was during this seminar when I came across the Espaliu Library for the first time, although I hardly paid it any attention. I consider that the Marginalia project was a failure because of two reasons. Well, the first thing is that the project, well, thanks to uh, paying attention to the library, it uh, prevented its uh, dismantling. But I'm afraid that I can't give you all the details. But in any case, the Provincial Council did away with the library in 2014. And we have two pictures where you can see all the boxes in 2014, which is when the Provincial Council of Gipuzkoa said that uh, this uh, was going to be donated to the Pepe Spalu Centre of Arts in Córdoba. They said that it was going home, but the, the truth is that that library had never been in Córdoba in the first place. And I've just been told that I've got uh, half an hour, uh, no, 15, 15 minutes, okay, perfect then. On the other hand, um, what uh, I really feel is that I've become involved in institutional processes that were happening in, a real, on, in real time through an artistic project, but this had an influence on my experience with the Espalu workshop and uh, the fact that I was able to understand what was going on, and that meant that I was somewhat utilitarian in my approach. And in hindsight, I also recognized that these energies after the project, which was somewhat adolescent, especially as regards my reading of carrying, were perhaps excessively contentious because they were reacting to what others had already mentioned about the experience uh, before. So my revision project corresponds to what I call a symptomatic approach, something that insists on seeing what things hide instead of uh, becoming committed to what they already say. And in my recent uh, doctoral thesis, and I've not developed anything related to this, but I've tried to um, remedy or find a remedy to the inquisitive uh, approach that medicine and cultural analysis have projected on the AIDS archive since the crisis began, as we know it. So my revision, I wanted it to be a gaze that were to take into the frailty of the practices and experiences that I had, and I wanted to describe what was going on. Likewise, I've also tried to offer the case that recognizes the distance of my vision and the fact that my access to the experiences that were investigated are second-hand. In other words, they are always influenced by the material surface of photographs and documents, so computer screens and uh, exhibition cabinets. And in the thesis, I referred to this method of interpretation as if it were a superficial uh, lecture or superficial reading or on the surface. And, uh, well, this has to do with the visual culture that suggests that attention has to be paid to what, to things, to what things already say or to what appears in a text or in an image or in an object instead of always uh, diving down into the depths. And this is a kind of gaze that produces a visibly descriptive kind of uh, writing and deals with uh, statements like that of Frederick Jameson's that said that there's only the descriptive, uh, weak and empirical and ideological, um, ideological um, readers that uh, look at the surface. A descriptive uh, writing, which André Le Picky mentions in his second book, Singularities, cannot be understood as if it were a verbal and accurate transcription, but rather as uh, attention paid to those moments uh, when something is happening. But in order to finish and in order to, uh, well, to describe uh, the attention that I pay to Espadu, and this is perhaps uh, represents a new relationship with this material, but I would like to close this presentation by describing a fragment uh, on the video of the carrying action.
Well, you can see on the screen behind me, you can see the digital copy of the video register of the carrying action uh, with which uh, Pepe Spalu closed the sculpture workshop that he gave in 1992 at Arteleco. The video is about 20 minutes long, and uh, we'll see something like 10. And uh, this was commissioned by Arteleco, and they asked uh, Nekane Elizonda, Spiedi and Ross Seges, and it's uh, made up of three blocks. The central one that we will not be seeing has to do with the register of the carrying action. And the third and final block that is shorter, which we won't see either, and talks about uh, what was done at the end of the carrying and which was all about writing on a large um, white uh, bedsheet carried by volunteers down the street and with the names of the families and friends that died because of HIV. So, in the initial part, what is uh, what we're watching right now, this corresponds to the preparative work that took place at uh, Arteleco on the morning of September the 26th, 1992. And I've decided to show this section because of several reasons. Because it is self-explanatory. Because it describes the collective and artistic context from which this action results. But it's also, it's also well, like the uh, paper of uh, the... Um, exhibition because it shows the rehearsals of the performance and uh, in the video Espadu uses both terms to refer to this action and performance that was going to take place that afternoon at the San Sebastian Centre and it's an ex exhibition because it's a public enunciation because the objective of the carrying was to say that AIDS is something that affects all of us and these images, this footage is accompanied by, um, the, by a voiceover by Espadu and uh, during these first, uh, I think it's two and a half minutes, Espalieu establishes the con context and defines carrying out as the project of a sculptor. And the title, the other says, uh, refers to assisting terminal patients with AIDS carrying, which uh, brings together the words in English to take care of and to carry as in uh, AIDS carrier. And the fact well, here we can see who identifies Jorge González with a white jacket and with the red ribbon and uh, the T-shirt that was designed for the occasion. He explains uh, things to the volunteers. He explains to them, oh, sorry, he explains practical details. And uh, we were, they were going to walk down the Paseo de la República Argentina and then continue down the boulevard and uh, walk past uh, the Teatro Victoria Eugenia. And during the first section, the uh, visual reference uh, would be the palm trees on Republica Argentina that are situated every 12 meters, whereas the totality of uh, the, uh, the distance covered would be marked from 1 to 47 by means of a uh, numbered adhesive tape that we can see Manu holding at a given point in time. Whereas in the pictures, we can see a demonstration of how each uh, couple was supposed to cross their arms, and this is supposed to um, provide them with greater comfort and stability. And in Expalio talks about the formal source from which carrying arises, and this uh, palanquin, and it's uh, like a carriage whose only two aims were to transport nobility and um, sick people, and which the artist had already used in previous sculptures. In the voiceover, Espadu explains that it was in the workshop together with the participants where he decided to trans transfer these sculptures to an action on the street. In other words, to transform it into an artistic performance. We can see the poet Leopoldo Maria Bonero, who was also involved in carrying and who a fortnight earlier had already been involved in the workshop with a poetry recital and who formed part of the parallel activities that also included a cycle of lectures focused on the um, concept of waste or residue with uh, guests like José Luis Brea or Ángel González, as well as two of the um, speakers at the symposium, uh, Corinne Dissidens and Catherine David, who, well, well, this uh, it, there's no mention made in the Arteroco archives regarding whether their presentations were given. But on the walls we can see a number of uh, photocopies, uh, blown up photocopies, with um, essays that were um, described a few days earlier in La Tadeco and which were hung on the wall as a visual reminder. And after the first rehearsal, rehearsal the group of participants went outside to have a snack. 
And here we can see Santi Rasso, who's the director of Trico, who we already saw before. And we could also see the artist Gemma Inchausti and José Ramón Amondrain, and the historian Ismael Manterola, and the critic and uh, curator Mada Clot, and uh, Juan Vicente Aliaga as a young man, the author of many exhibitions and text on this value, and who for at least two decades was uh, who defended the work done by this artist. And we would also see Gaby Calparsoro, um, born in San Sebastian, who in the late 80s had uh, lived in New York and had got in touch with ACT UP and who was the organiser of the lecture that the founding member of ACT UP, John Greenberg, gave at the Espalieu workshop before he died because of uh, AIDS-related complications. But we can't see, in this fragment, we can't see the artists Cristina Iglesias and Juan Muñoz who in 1989 had uh, invited Espalieu to their workshop in Arturico, and which is the president of this uh, workshop that I mentioned before. And we, we can't see Marcelo Otamendi, who one year later, in 1993, until the newspaper Egunkari was closed down by the judge, was the director of the Egunkari newspaper. And uh, as occurred with Iglesias and Muñoz, he was also involved in the afternoon event. So here we can see people eating, getting ready for the afternoon. And Espaliu in the voiceover says that a performance always has unexpected elements. Those are the carrying with two. One, the rain and the acceleration of the performance because it took place in a shorter time than what had been initially planned. And after eating, we can see how rehearsals uh, continued with uh, bodies that do not belong to Espalio. And uh, here we have the all the um, pamphlets thrown on the ground with the words in uh, Basque and Spanish, yesa and aid. And here we have a physical location between umbrellas and palm, tree, palm trees in the centre of uh, San Sebastian before, well, I've finished before the pictures, uh, before the video. And then uh, now, if we've run out of time, we can stop here and we can move on to your questions if you want. Okay, well, let's uh, just watch the pictures then. Let's watch the video, if you don't mind.
Mabi Esker. Thank you very much. Well, if you have any specific questions, uh, we uh, if not, we'd move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. That was uh, amazing. I, I don't. Uh, I was in Artileco in '94, uh, mm -hmm. and I saw the library there, and I never knew about the context of it. And I, you did that really beautiful. But if you wouldn't mind, it would be great to know more about. Um, his relation as a form of production, what we saw in the video, also as an archive and probably as a community for, I saw Inya King Sausti there, who was also uh, mm -hmm. part of that group. Um, if you could say more about like what social role, this, but you said art, but it also had a yeah. very social element, I guess, and what it meant for the community, uh, or if there was another space. Which community you mean? Uh, well, HIV community, or like if there was a connection, because it, I think in that time there was often, there was an overlap, there mm -hmm. were community spaces that were not art spaces, uh -huh. uh, there were art spaces that opened themselves or were taken, so uh, I'm t Bilbao is a very different place than New York. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, en castellano? Or? Sí. Shall I answer in Spanish? Well, if I understood your question uh, correctly, well, you wanted me to say a little bit more about the social context. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm not sure if I understood. If I'm not sure if the question had to do with the with the um, connection between the workshop and the context at that time related to AIDS, the library. But then you went to well, the... Well, I think in relation to the HIV crisis, yeah, yeah. there are different functions that art institutions have, yeah, right? Yeah. And one is uh, 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 social, yeah. uh, one is about mourning, one is what you say about caring, even though the caring is articulated as art, yeah. and then there's art. So I think it has the relation between a community, a crisis, uh -huh. and art has a very broad function, and sometimes yeah, that is located in an art institution, but very rarely. So I yeah. wanted to know if you yeah. could expand. Vale. Um, so I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to go... And I would speak in Spanish then. Well, I think that it's important. I think that the descriptions that we've uh, made, I think it's important to point out that the, the Espalio um, workshop was not publicized and uh, nothing was really mentioned in relation to AIDS. In other words, it was a sculpture workshop that was based on the idea of uh, Lestor, where the presentation and the presentation, there was a little genealogy of uh, contemporary artists that are working on this issue of uh, the Lestor in philosophical and symbolic terms. In the workshop, it was a sculpture workshop, basically. And Espaliu, between those months or in those months, he, let's say, that what he said, he made it publicly known that he was an HIV uh, carrier. He mentioned this um, during the months that the workshop took place. And this is how he generated lots of um, trust, and he was encouraged, together with the rest of the participants, to um, carry out that uh, sculpture um, exercise to take his sculptures out onto the street. And um, while I've mentioned uh, Joseph Boyce and um, things that had to do with the social sculpture, and that was the framework in which uh, you had to interpret this Balu's work. But let's say that the connection Mm, between the workshop and Arturecu in relation to the AIDS crisis is very modest. I think that Arturecu, Arturecu was an artistic institution that was already working in this field, or at least had a degree of involvement uh, with these uh, specific social issues. So it was Espalu, but let's say in a very modest manner, in a very discreet manner, who introduced uh, this issue of AIDS, 
who introduced it into the context of the workshop, and that it's true that there were also participants or other um, um, serum positive um, participants in the workshop. Well, considering that there was a great atmosphere of trust, they made uh, known their health status, and the workshop lasted uh, three months. And it's unthinkable for something like that to last uh, three months nowadays. When we spoke about specific conditions, this is one of them. And in those uh, three months, yes, uh, very solid uh, ties, very solid links were established with the social organizations that were working in the field of prevention or that were activists in relation to AIDS. For instance, in carrying, Agdur was involved, which is a Catalonian organization with which uh, contact was established and uh, they came all the way to San Sebastian. Or, for instance, uh, the participation of John Greenberg, which was a coincidence because he was there in San Sebastian because he was visiting his friend, Gabi Calparsoro. So there was no programmatic uh, meaning involved in relation to AIDS. So these were the conditions that, we, that were there at that time that made it possible to establish this connection, this connection with this social reality. Hi, my name is Sir Ricardo, and I'm AIDS uh, positive. I have been so since 1987. Where are you? Because I can't see you. I'm over here. As you know, the acronym AIDS people have had to um, find euphemisms to refer to AIDS because. There was lots of fear in the air because people were talking about a social monster and things like that in those, in those days. And that had a very big impact, especially in the 80s and the 90s. And uh, a little bit later than that, when the death rate had reached its highest level, to its highest peak. By mixing culture with the AIDS phenomenon, It's uh, easier, or it's uh, more natural to pronounce this word, because I'm not afraid of words, really. But I think what we should uh, clarify, and I'm doing so very humbly, because I, nobody has mentioned this, I believe, but I would like to point this out very clearly. We have the issue that in the case of um, uh, the um, AIDS-positive um, people, the word AIDS refers to one final bit of the disease. In other words, this refers to the terminal stage of the disease. And uh, this is not uh, from today, but since many years ago, mention is being made of HIV carriers, but well, it would be HIV AIDS, okay, more than anything else. And I would like to congratulate you for, well, I would like to congratulate you and uh, all of the rest of the people from the world of uh, the social cultural fear that are here to make this phenomenon visible and also to raise our awareness because I suppose that this is what this is all aimed at. Uh, it's all aimed at um, achieving a greater level of awareness between people. And I would also like to say something about other issues that have to do with art, like uh, art therapy in relation to HIV because I'm also a student, I'm studying um, social education and one of those days I would like to work in that field and I know that um, well, some things have already been done in the field of music therapy and also in the field of art therapy and that's what I wanted to say and I'm sorry for speaking up but anyway I felt that I had to say this. Well no thank you for speaking up, thank you. Well, let's say that my presentation, my presentation did not take into account the reality of uh, living with HIV today. So in other words, it was focusing on this uh, particular experience of 1992 and in Espalu's case, well, somebody, when the last uh, stages of the development of AIDS, let's say that this uh, we're talking about uh, before 1996, but since then we know that lots of developments have taken place that have changed completely what it's uh, like to live with HIV. So I would like to thank you very much indeed for um, uh, addressing this issue at this point in time as if it were his, a historic revision. So thank you very much for your comments.
Kelly is present. Good evening. Um, I want to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. And I'll also start with two apologies. The first is for speaking in English, but my Spanish is very bad, so you should be grateful. And um, the second is also an apology for the quality of the images, which is pretty poor and which is in itself a kind of embodiment of part of what I'll be talking about today. Um, the the um, lack of resources to document. So, more than a uh, post-colonial or anti-imperialist project, as I see it, the third Havana Biennial was a challenge to fundamental assumptions that underlay the project of what we know as contemporary art and what was its nascent interest in questioning its own Eurocentrism in the time that we're talking about, which is the end of the 80s. One of the Havana Project's contestations that I'll look at today was in its questioning of the assumptions about moderni modernity's categorical departure from what was called tradition, which was a core concept put forward by the Biennale. Additionally, and also in recognition of this symposium structuring according to ascending levels of the term region, which the organizers have identified, namely Bilbao, Basque Country, the Spanish state, and Europe, I'll be looking or framing the Biennale's globalism, noting the ways in which the project proposed a globalism centered in the cultural activities definitions and meanings of what was at the time called the margins. Finally, and given that the opening week of the third Biennale coincided with the collapse of the Berlin Wall, I'll note some of the ways in which the situation in Havana, specifically with regard to activity in visual art, was impacted by events that had been unfolding in the Comic-Con nations, which were Cuba's allies and lifetime, economic lifeline, and which heightened the tension between the Biennale and the evolving political position of the country. Um, this is the catalog cover from 1989. The third Biennale was one of the first exhibitions of contemporary art to aspire to a global reach, both in terms of content and impact, and it was the first to do so from outside of the European and North American art system, which until then had undertaken to decide what art had global significance. The Biennale was a wide-ranging, heterodox, and rambunctious affair, comprised of shows, discussions, and social spaces, both formal and informal. Its large central exhibition was offset by dozens of smaller displays and events that tackled aspects of contemporaneous cultural production in the Biennale's focal regions of Latin America, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. It presented work by a range of producers that included not only some very young artists and some who were legendary in stature, but also doll makers, admirers of Simon Bolivar, and children inventing their own toys. The conference organized as part of the Biennale included contributions from highly influential cultural theoreticians and yielded a debate, again, both formal and impromptu, that was remarkable for its richness and energy. All of this was held together under the loose thematic umbrella 
of tradition and contemporaneity. And all of it was put together with a budget and infrastructure that were minuscule. Its more dispersed structure was a field of activity that basically took over the entire city, providing an extraordinary degree of public access and participation. <clears throat> this is a catalog from an exhibition, Los Hijos de Guillaume Motel. The Third Biennale was also a key moment in terms of Cuban cultural history, opening at the end of a decade that had seen the rise of an extraordinary movement of young artists in Havana and amidst an escalating confrontation between them and Cuban cultural authorities, which you get the idea from the title of the show. Um, moreover, as I've mentioned, the week that the Biennale opened was the week that the Berlin Wall fell, which nobody there saw coming placing the event at the fulcrum between the political landscape that had given rise to it and the ominous and unknown territory that lay ahead. The Biennale was founded in 1984. Its inauguration came in the wake of an especially fraught period in Cuban history known as the Quinquenio Gris, during which the vanguardist internationalism and tendency among many of the island's most important creators, to see culture as critical social conscience, came into increasing conflict with the revolution's own evolving ideas of culture as a popular and collective activity. A complicated web of discourses anathematizing critical interventions into what were called extra artistic matters, such as social ills, political errors, eventually resulted in a landscape in which criticism by artists and intellectuals was discouraged, suppressed, repressed, and punished, occasionally with severity. All of this, together with the exodus from Marielle in 1980, had been an international embarrassment for the Cuban regime. The Biennale de La Habana was a key initiative in a new political strategy for the Ministry of Culture. It would defend the government's reputation by broadcasting the richness of the country's cultural life. And more broadly, it would reposition the country in the international arena. The Biennale was unprecedented for the extent of its global ambition, while also notable as a resolutely local effort. It aimed at nothing less than creating for the art and artists of what was at the time called the Third World, a space of respect and stature equal to that granted to artists in the developed West. It would replace the historical cultural dependency of the third world with a new cultural order, international cultural order, by creating transversal circuits of communication. Although the idea of a third world had arisen as a mutual political project among newly independent nations defining themselves as non-aligned. Over time, the concept had become problematic. Among other things, the vastly different histories of conquest, exploitation, subjugation, and of course, socioeconomic fallout that distinguished each of the nations within this grouping meant that they could only be united as a single undifferentiated and underdeveloped terrain from a great distance. Even among the member states, the rubric of third world had always remained largely abstract and of limited political utility, blurring as much as it signified and masking conflict under the alibi of solidarity. Worse still, the homogeneity that the term implied sublated the asymmetry of the first world versus third world opposition into a deceptively balanced configuration. By the 1980s, the project's failure in economic, political, and social terms meant that the words third world were often wrapped in quotation marks. This is the opening ceremony of the Biennale in November 1989. 
Clearly, the whole idea of making what was um, set out to be a third world exhibition had to answer to those issues, and that created a paradox. How could the Biennale proceed as an aggregate formation without falling into the trap of a single, flattened conception of its subject? What might be the relative uses of the summoning of similarities or the elaboration of differences? How could it formulate a third world as cultural proposition not based in the fictions of solidarity? How could the Biennale, following the protagonist role that it had declared for itself, create a space that was more than just a counter proposal that reproduced the logic and form of the original only in reverse? The Biennale then raised important questions, not only about the nature of art made outside of the Western market system, but also about that art's relationship to that system. These are inevitably questions about culture and power, and I'll try to get at some of the implications of that. Um, okay, Gillian Janis, who served as director of the Biennale from the second through the seventh iterations, envisioned it overall as a meeting place, both between the artists and the life of the city and among the artists themselves. From the start, she undertook an energetic campaign to link the Biennale to the um, Sede Eres, which is the, the Committees for the Defense of the Revolution, which were a key structure, a key piece in the political structure, linking people to, um, to political leadership. So the linkage was both with these neighborhood watches and also building ties with a number of governmental agencies, including the ministries of culture, tourism, exterior relations, and the armed forces. This is not a typical structure for a biennial. And even the Central Committee of the Communist Party, also n not something I know of elsewhere. Her efforts yielded massive audiences. The first Biennale in 1986 had 200,000 visitors, most of them from the city. And in 1986, 300,000 people. The Biennale generated extraordinary energy and excitement among all of those attendees, and the sense of being in the midst of something momentous was quite palpable. While Janice's leadership was indisputable, Gerardo Mosquera was undeniably the leader of the curatorial work. He reformulated the premise and devised the methodology of the Biennale between 1985 and 89. And its growth during those years is clearly identifiable with his unorthodox and restless spirit. Moreover, Mosquera's own aesthetic and intellectual interests became deeply embedded in and even definitive of the Biennale's fabric. A clear example of this was his sustained research into Afro-Cuban spiritual practices on the island, which was spurred in part by the work of artists such as Jose Beria, Ricardo Bray, and Juan Francisco Elso. Mosquera's interest in that stemmed from the fact that those traditions were alive and ubiquitous in the daily life of the country, an integral part of the way people lived their lives despite the official atheistic precepts of the socialist state. All of this meant that rather than the usual separation between contemporary artists and popular culture, in Cuba, there was a very dynamic linkage that he was identifying. For Mosquera, this imbued the work with a vitality and immediacy that drew sharp contrast with the dutifully and rhetorically patriotic culture espoused in Cuba of the 1970s. His research on behalf of the Biennale proceeded from those certain convictions about the relation of traditions to contemporary experience which was the subject that came to define the Biennale in 1989. Mosquera was also a prolific and ardent supporter of the emerging movement of young Cuban artists, defending them against the accusations of the old guard, who saw them as, and these will be quotes from, um, from the press of the day, formalists, abandoners of the cultural values of Cuban national identity, puppets of imperialism, and, of course, ideological diversionists. The new Cuban art was an extraordinary phenomenon, 
which had erupted in the midst of a claustrophobic and oppressive cultural climate and comprised a rebuttal to it, characterized above all by its freshness of spirit. Born just around the time of the revolution, those artists were formed not only by its encroaching orthodoxies, but also by its poetic idealism and dedication to independence. They proposed an art that was free from ideological coercion, expressive of the complex cultural heritages of the island and connected to contemporary practices elsewhere in the world. This is uh, Por America by Juan Francisco Elso. It's an effigy of Jose Marti. Above all, they insisted on an art that, rather than towing the revolution's line, was revolutionary in its ethical foundation and its independence of thought. Over the course of the 1980s, their work accelerated into a critical movement, spilling out of studios, classrooms, and galleries into the streets and magnetizing a large and diverse audience by raising taboo subjects such as, very taboo subjects, such as corruption, dogmatism, cult of personality, and lack of democracy. Mosquera brought this energetic movement into the heart of the Biennale, where it bolstered his vision of the intricate links between art and the life of the society. He and Janis recognized that the Biennale would have to position itself consciously in relation to the mainstream or Western art system. While essentially opposed to that system, it had to do something other than stand in simple negation of it for both theoretical and pragmatic reasons. Simply creating a sort of third world ghetto would be unproductive, and acknowledgement in established Western art world, art world circles was important to the prestige of the Havana project. So in one of the many ironies of the power dynamics at play, it was clear that by developing credibility in precisely the arena that it existed to defy, the Biennale could amplify its importance to third world artists. It also had to contend with the fact that while the conception of the third world that the Biennale was working to develop was one based in cultural considerations rather than in global power plays, the whole project was nonetheless enfolded in the geopolitics of the Cold War. Cold War. Okay, this is a poster that was made by Jose Beria for the conference. And again, my apologies for the image. Mosquera and his team settled on the theme of tradition and contemporaneity for the Biennale in 1989. Although this was a very broad rubric, it suggested an unease with both terms as typically understood, namely as opposites of a sort, and proposed an overall reconsideration of the roots of contemporaneity in regions where modernity had been experienced through the process of colonization. This was a complicated task. In many locations that the uh, curatorial team visited, so-called contemporary art was not well established or even recognized as a practice. And there was little or no arts infrastructure in its conventional forms, namely um, major cultural establishments, art academies, developed systems of training, gallery activity, museums, collections, all those kinds of things. All of this meant that each site the curators visited presented its own set of parameters and criteria through which the ideas of things like art, tradition, contemporaneity, and third world would all be encountered. In other words, these were all redefined anew in each location. This situation gave rise to the question of what operative definition of art would guide them. A tight and restrictive definition would disallow most of the variety that they hoped to capture, while too unstructured an approach would yield an unfocused and also unproductive array. The curatorial team's goal of presenting the contemporary art of the third world seems potentially naive and simplistic. And so here, the acknowledgement of what 
Mosquera called the Western basis of contemporary art, regardless of where it's produced, became key to the project's theoretical viability. Mosquera states clearly that they were curating contemporary art in this particular sense. We were starting out, he said, with the idea that there was a certain language that was shared. We were dealing with a westernized art, artists who were producing what we called contemporary art. Accordingly, the extreme heterogeneity of the works that the Biennale counters encounter, curators encountered in the research was seen to be heterogeneous within that unifying framework. This, among other things, was a candid position which made no attempt to insist or to prove that third world countries and cultures had thrown off all traces of colonialist experience. The Biennale, though still wrapped in a somewhat old fashioned third world rhetoric, had actually moved beyond its nationalist and identitarian roots by 1989. And that's an evolution that's probably best understood in terms of cosmopolitanism. This was not only a key strategy in terms of establishing a coherent curatorial platform, it worked to position the Biennale in important ways. Presenting works from third world country, countries in the context of Western art history was timely, given the intense and ongoing debate about the persistent othering of such works by the established Western art world, infamously in the primitivism show at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 1984, and also in the kind of West or Rest rhetoric of Magicien de la Terre in 1989 in Paris, just a few months before the Biennale, actually. It was consonant with the emerging awareness of a newly globalized landscape, which, at least in principle, was replacing that old model um, that called things in terms of center and periphery. It was a way to avoid what might otherwise have become simply another project of indigenous or localist activism. And it inscribed local experience within this much larger circle of meaning. This was a tricky line to negotiate, however, since internationalism, or at least certain versions of it, had been so integral to the imperialist and hegemonic colonial project. The Biennale's task then was to work from the many and different claims to modernity that had been laid, and this is whether during or subsequent to periods of colonial domination. Uh, all those claims to modernity with all of their varying modes of adoption, recalibration, and reformulation. This accounts for the emphasis on specificity that Mosquera reflected at the time when he said that the curatorial team were principally interested in, quote, how the work functions in its context, the value which it has, the kind of response which it generates, and whether such a response could be instructive for the third world in general. Uninterested in an art produced and circulating according to restrictive rules of access and financialized standards of value, the Biennale set out to discover what that same art, that is, a symbolic visual production made in cognizance of the tradition of such production through and subsequent to Western modernism, what that art might look like, act like, or aspire to when it was produced in the regions that had an intrinsically critical relation to that foundation. That was one part of it. But along with all that, the fact is that the organizers didn't stick to contemporary art. They strayed into popular creativity of various forms, not so much claiming them as art as looking for resonances. The Biennale didn't try to draw an equivalence between those objects and the ones made by artists. So very much unlike Magicien de la Terre, it did not orchestrate that convergence under the alibi of some universal creative spirit. It didn't claim every contributor as a magician, but rather as a citizen. 
And so the zone it sketched was not some neutrally shared terrain, but rather a vexed ground as much comprised of clashing particularities as of cohering accords. A polemically third worldist project that accepted Western art history as the lingua franca and an exhibition of contemporary art that contravened its own definitions, the Biennale found urgency in those unresolved tensions. It was structured as a gigantic montage comprised of a central exhibition and what the curators called nucleos, cu clustered explorations of specific themes in 24 small exhibitions and a robust program of debates, meetings, and workshops, including a printmaking workshop they organized using a steamroller on the street to make prints. It was not only a place of specialized interchange, but also, and at the same time, a more fully public and permeable space, a kind of organism in which all of the parts implicated each other. One of those nucleos addressed the presence of cultural traditions in contemporary artistic languages, presenting works that, as they put it, tackle living cultural traditions with the instrument of the contemporary language of visual art. For example, exhibitions at the Casa de Africa paired Chokwe sculpture with the work by Angolan painters Victor Teixeira and Antonio Ole. Teixeira had been employed by an ethnographic museum, and his work was directly influenced by this exposure to the styles of wood carving traditional among the Chokwe people of Central Africa. While the gambit of pairing traditional with contemporary forms directly descended from them was quite predictable as a curatorial strategy, there were a couple of factors that made the display more intriguing. First was the fact that the Chokwe objects, while described as a cultural production that was traditional in an orthodox way, were apparently also being produced as art for tourists, but with artistic value. This is the Biennale's language. This complicated the Chokwe object's placement in the Biennale as examples of traditional art. Further complexity was added since this show was in the Casa de Africa, which houses, among other things, the collection of objects and implements related to Afro-Cuban religious practice that had been put together by Fernando Ortiz, the great early 20th century Cuban anthropologist along with an eccentric array of gifts to the Cuban people given by various African dig dignitaries in the years since 1989, all arranged in groupings by country and according to the designations of traditional and modern. So there are la these nesting layers of definitions about what tradition is and what contemporaneity is and what culture is. If nothing else, the act of placing the Biennale show in the midst of this striking amalgam of 19th century museology and political kitsch was a provocative and mischievous curatorial gesture. Another nucleo featured forms of popular culture that had developed in close relation to local histories, including two exceptional exhibitions, one of wire toys made by children in six sub-Saharan African countries, and the other of wooden effigies of Simon Bolivar, the liberator who had led the early 19th century Latin American wars of independence. Carved by so-called popular artists from Venezuela, the latter figures were an interesting testament to how malleable and variable such supposedly iconic figures actually are in the collective imagination. Bolivar appeared alternately tall or squat, venerable or humble, white, black, or Indian, famously astride his horse or asleep in a modest bed. He was, in this composite portrait, a version of the people who had depicted him with such familiarity. The display mixed the dozens of figures together in an informal grouping made dynamic by the sudden shifts in scale and the plastic approach, again an example of the informality that was typical across the Biennale's installations. The exhibition of wire toys had a similarly spontaneous feel, 
given both the fabrication style of the objects and the way they were scattered around the gallery space. With antecedents in the bamboo toy airplanes made by Dogon children in the 1930s, the wire toys continued in that tradition of inventing sculptural processes, making use of whatever materials were readily available. The wire along with tin cans and rubber being the detritus of industrial manufacture introduced through colonization. Although it was maybe a sentimental idea to make a museum display out of creativity fueled by poverty, which is basically what this is, the project was given a certain edge by its placement in the Museo de Artes Decorativas. The museum, which occupies the former mansion of the Contessa de Reviga de Camargo, had since 1964, so in other words, since five years after the revolution, housed a collection notable for its European nobility and opulence. In that setting, the display of wire toys worked in the way that the institutional critique proposed by people like Fred Wilson some years later in exhibitions like Mining the Museum. Deconstructing the historical and ideological identity of the museum as both a colonial and a revolutionary era institution. The tensions around the toy status as art were heightened by the fact that these were objects already on their way to becoming a tourist commodity. As Mosquera explained in the catalog, the production and circulation of the toys took place on a number of levels starting with very young children who were simply creating their own toys out of necessity, and culminating in a rank of adolescents who, having become expert fabricators, sold their works in the great markets of Kinshasa and Brazzaville. The toys were, in other words, a class of objects that had already begun its transformation from spontaneous creation to one that anticipated its own export. Their contaminated status then relieved some of the erratic reverence that was projected by the Bolivar show. Rather than claiming these as works of art, however, it seems more interesting to accept their presence in the Biennale on somewhat other terms. Their role was not to be more art, but rather to be other than art and to stand in relation to it in an interesting or illuminating way. This then could underscore a point about the extreme heterodoxy of art and creativity, especially in a third world context, which was the point the Biennale was trying to make. Rejecting the binary of pure aesthetic versus direct use value the Biennale began to su suggest a range of relations and meanings that complicated and enriched the debate about art's relation to everyday life and to politics. It was developing this train of thought between 1984 and 1989, years bracketed in the Western Metropolitan Centers by the Primitivism and Magicien de la Terre exhibitions, each of which had been open to accusations of perpetuating, although in quite different ways, neocolonial thinking. The Biennale was, in part, a refutation of that thinking, but it was also, and I think more importantly, a project of rethinking how art's presence and meanings exist in relation to other cultural forms. In this, it was a challenge to the re reductiveness of both the socialist culture of the masses model and also the typically high art arena of the other biennials. The Biennale was more heterodox than both of those alternatives and also more interested in the operations of cultural expressions than in their classification. With the international conference that was organized as a key part of the 1989 Biennale, the project developed a role as a preeminent cultural space for discussion about culture, bringing together a distinguished group of critics and theorists from Latin America, Asia, Africa, and beyond. And just to name a few of the participants, Juan Acha from Mexico, from Zaire, Baribanga, Nemuine, from Sudan, Rashid Diap, 
Jorge Glusberg from Argentina, Geta Kapoor from India, from Peru, Mirko Lauer, Sergio Magalhaes, Federico Moraes, and Lisbeth Rebollo from Brazil, from Chile, Nelly Richard, Roberto Segre from Cuba, Ali Sinon from Burkina Faso. You get an idea of the breadth. Um, while many of the Latin Americans already knew each other's work, the gathering of scholars from so many different regions, each of them, and remember this is 1989, the internet did not exist, so um, it, it, people couldn't look each other up. Each of them emerged in a parallel but very distinct debate over questions of culture in post-colonial settings, made for animated discussions in the packed auditorium. As Kapoor later put it, the experience in Havana allowed her to relate to internationalism in a much broader way, more able to deploy what she called those tricky concepts of modernity, internationalism, and avant-garde in the service of a critical project. So the conference, also titled Tradition and Contemporaneity, was formed around the problematic of how to relocate the Biennale in a very complicated and conflictive internationality. Perhaps the first point to make here is that both tradition and contemporaneity were fraught terms, although for very different reasons. Tradition, as it pertained outside the Western world, had often been, been viewed from the Western centers as either exotic or primitive, linked to an authenticity that was stuck some indeterminate place in the past. Meanwhile, tradition had also been argued for in opposition to modernity, put forward as a key weapon in the ever-present struggle against neocolonial and imperialist incursions into local cultural development. The modern was irreversibly, in this view, irreversibly alienated from the local and traditional by virtue of what the Mexican writer Marta Traba had called the terrorism of the vanguards. As antidote, Traba and others had proposed an art of resistance in the vein of nationalist Mexican muralism, in effect proposing a regime of liberatory reason as a third world move against the instrumental reason presumed to lie at the heart of Western modernity. At the same time, Tradition had also been a fundamental tool of authoritarian and anti-modern aspects of nation building in projects such as um, Zaire, for example, while at the same time also an element of more leftist nation building exercises as in India and Mexico. So all of those um, contradictions were defined by the word tradition. By 1989, however, such thinking was proving outdated, especially for its prioritization of identity construction as the principal cultural dynamic. This point was made repeatedly at the conference, and while anti-colonialism was acknowledged as having played an important role in asserting local identities against forces of Eurocentrism, questions were raised concerning what it could offer for negotiating the present. The oppositional relation between tradition and contemporaneity that these arguments demanded fit poorly in a reality in which popular expressions of tradition were suffused with and responsive to the present day. Furthermore, an essentialist identity politics couldn't easily be mapped onto the dispersed and diasporic nature of contemporaneous societies with their ever accelerating movements of capital, culture, and people. At base, the question of tradition and contemporaneity was about the power relations that shape and inform assertions of the local in relation to the global. Rejecting those conservative meanings in which tradition was mostly a caricature deployed in the name of third world culture, the curators of the Biennale and the debates took up the question from a much less bifurcated perspective. Rather than connoting an indispensable and essential cultural practice, tradition was for them a comparative term. 
In place of an either-or formulations, the discussions tried to account for the realities of a situation in which both tradition and contemporaneity existed simultaneously and in, in a productively complex and fraught relation. Tradition was conceived in broadly transcultural and contemporary terms and linked to an idea of popular creativity. Traditions in this sense were residual rather than archaic, and in fact, often closely related to emergent artistic and cultural forms. Traditions, in other words, were redefined or reconceptualized as a living force that could be articulated in a contemporary and international idiom. And they were therefore important because they made manifest the complicated history of cultural encounters within the colonial and post-colonial process. This approach facilitated and legitimated a third world claim to contemporaneity while recognizing its capacity to originate its own contemporary forms. An internationally prevalent idea of contemporaneity, meanwhile, assumed it to be the obverse of the third world's supposed backwardness and underdevelopment. And so in parallel fashion, the Biennale insisted on multiple and distinct contemporaneities and on a model of culture that was fundamentally conglomerate and therefore impure and always unfinished. It was a model that allowed for an approach to the local not mired in the archaic and of globality not flattened into homogeneity. What the Biennale also suggested is that engagement with so-called universal culture, which is the hallmark of both modernity and contemporaneity, was even beyond an occasion for a self-affirming resistance, which, is, which was a central motif of third world modernism, also a useful foil. Contemporaneity, as defined in 1989 in Havana, meant in some cases a condition of self-reflexivity on the part of artists and works, just as it did in the more developed circuits of cultural production and distribution. But this was always embedded in a complicated process, not only of decontextualization, but also of recontextualizing that contemporaneity into many different socioeconomic networks. As in the arguments that had been made against locking tradition into a condition of interpretive closure, the sense of the contemporary that the Biennale argued for placed it within a broader history in order to find connections between various pasts and presents. As I've mentioned, the Biennale's rise had coincided with the development and rapid intensification of a critical movement in contemporary art. That trajectory was cresting just as the third Biennale was opening its doors and was therefore a key element of the political space in which the Biennale maneuvered. A string of confrontations over politically charged exhibitions of the past year or so had superheated the atmosphere. There had been a kind of golden age for Cuban art during the 1980s, but by 1989, the period of detente was definitively over in the cultural sector. Culture, per se, was clearly out of favor. There was such deep mistrust of the young artists that Carlos Aldana, who was ideology chief for the Communist Party, had actually started to preview exhibitions, all exhibitions of contemporary art before they opened, in the months before the Biennale opened. Imagine, said one observer, the ideologue, the guy who is third in power, Fidel, Raul, and him, going to every art exhibition. <laughs> Speaking at the 1988 UNIAC conference, the Congress of Artists and Writers, Aldana had noted, and now I'll quote him, with dissatisfaction, the limited number of works inspired by internationalist assignments, be they civilian or military, carried out by the revolution. But the crisis, of course, extended well beyond the art scene. Mikhail Gorbachev's visit to Havana in April of 1989 had been a clear sign of the beginning of the end for the so-called special relationship 
including the end of subsidies. Indeed, once the Soviet Union withdrew its support, things on the island fell apart in breathtakingly short order. Meanwhile, in June of that year, General Arnaldo Ochoa, the hero of Cuban's, Cuba's Angola campaign, who had fought with Castro in the Sierra, was arrested on charges of corruption, misappropriation of economic resources, and drug trafficking. An abject confession, summary trial, and swift execution left much of the population reeling and deeply disillusioned. By the time the Biennale opened in November, the island's economy was a wreck, the situation in the city was deteriorating rapidly, and a scheme to rebuild based largely on tourism revenues had produced a system of so-called tourist apartheid that was a direct affront and humiliation to the vast majority of Cubans. 1989 was the start of an incredibly complex and contradictory transition in Cuban culture from the artistic efflorescence of the 1980s that had always, however, been looking over its shoulder to what preceded it in the 70s, to a crackdown in idioesthetic terms that ran parallel to a cynical move by the state to repurpose the cultural sector towards commercial rather than revolutionary benefits. 1989 was the moment when the utopian vision of the Biennale crossed paths with the realization that really existing socialism in Cuba and elsewhere had become an empty shell. It was when Cuba's total dependency, total dependency on the Soviet Union became starkly apparent. 1989 was the limit year when a sketch of the future began to emerge, the starting point for a long process of deterioration on a national scale. It was the year when artists started leaving in droves and Havana converted from a generative and contested site, a symbolic ground, into merely the place where the Biennale took place. It was when ambivalence came to rule ambivalence about art from both artists and officials, about defiance, about the relation of artists to institution and the relation of institutions to artists. The third Biennale took place at the confluence of all of these tensions and took them up with an optimism and sense of possibility that was characteristic of cultural energies in Cuba at the time. The double mandate to include the excluded and to rethink the meanings of art in excluded zones, both coincided and conflicted with policy directives on the island, setting the stage for eventual co-optation and absorption. But that mostly came later on, and in 1989 the project was at its height, challenging its visitors and its neighbors to think audaciously about art, cultural tradition, and the present in which they lived. Thanks. Any questions, please? Well, uh, thank you very much indeed, and thank you for that lecture. I have, I have uh, several questions for you, and the first question has to do with the role that was played by Gerardo Mosquera. And how Gerardo Mosquera supported young Cuban artists. And he said that it was important for young Cuban artists to be present at the biennial. But if I'm not mistaken, in your book, Making of the Global, I think she said, you also said that there was a conflict. I'm not sure if that's the most correct word. There was a conflict between Lilian Yanis and Gerardo Mosquera in relation to this issue. Because according to Lilian Yanis, the work done by young Cuban artists could be a distraction 
a distraction relative to the main goals that the centre was focused on. So could you say a little bit more about this, please, about this issue? And then there's something else that you you talk a lot about Lini Yanis, you talk about a lot about uh, Gerardo Mosquera, who had a very outstanding role in the first uh, biennials, but uh, there, there was other people who were there that was... Uh, Nathalie de Reisla, I think she said, and I'd like to know what a role was played by this person in this third edition of the biennial. Nathalie de la Rey, I think she said, if I didn't get it wrong. And then the final question, the final question that has to do with the um, theoretical events, you mentioned the presence of Juan Acha in Milkolauer or Federico, Federico Marais. So there was um, a participation of intellectuals from Latin America at the Havana Biennial. And I was just wondering, now moving on to Europe, I was just thinking about the diaspora, the Latin American diaspora in uh, Paris. So what role did the Latin American diaspora play in Paris uh, as regards the Havana Biennial? Well, you know that there are many connections between Paris and Havana through the figure of Pierre Aristani, I think she said. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, first about Gerardo and Gillian. Um, um, it's a, maybe it's it's worth saying something about who Gillian is. Um, she was, she is an architectural historian, um, not a person related to contemporary art, and it's pretty widely understood that the, one of the principal reasons why she was appointed director of the Biennale was because she was um, extremely well integrated into high levels of political power in the country. Her husband, Regino Botti, was the first minister of, of economy in 1959. So this is like a level of extreme trust. Um, the Biennale, as any public project in Cuba, um, had to be reliable because it would attract international attention, it would attract foreign vis visitorship, it would be one of the aspects of the state's projection of the nation. So, um, Mosquera had no such has still no such affiliations. Um, there was really um, rapidly intensifying political tension. Perestroika and Glasnost were happening in the Soviet Union. Fidel made super clear in 1986 that that was not going to happen in Cuba. And um, from between 86 and 89, there was just an intensification by the minute of the conflict between um, the cultural apparatus and artists. And um, nonetheless, um, one of the reasons that the Biennale was becoming a, a kind of locus of international attention was because of those artists. And that's a whole complicated story. But their work was, um, was well, it was extraordinary. Um, and the dynamic around it was also extraordinary. And it was, in addition to all of that, legible to <coughs> people like Lucy Lepard and Luis Kamnitzer, who spent a fair amount of time um, with those groups of artists and went back to New York and published reviews about it. So, um, so it was a tricky situation. The artists obviously could not be excluded from the Biennale, but they also could not be included on their own terms. So um, the solution, which I don't think anybody was happy with, was to organize a show that was called The Tradition of Humor, and to, with this sort of backstory alibi that humor is, is like a cornerstone of Cuban culture traditionally, um, going back to um, Jorge Maniac and his publication, Indagación del Choteo, and um, to frame it as rather than a political response, a political cultural response, 
um, to frame it as, you know, just in the long tradition of humorists in Cuba. So that's what that was about. Um, Nelson. Nelson is one of the only people who has actually survived since the beginning, who's still on the BNL team. Every, I think maybe he and one or two other people. Um, unlike almost any other biennial, in Cuba it has always been an in-house team. They have not hired external um, famous people to come in and, and lead the curatorial project. Um, Nelson at that at that early time was um, one of the curators. He's an architect by training. I can't remember what his brief was. In general, each curator had like a certain area, geographic area. And I don't remember what Nelson was doing at the time. He did become the director once Julian left. So I think it must have been the eighth Biennale that, that he directed. But he was removed after that because it didn't go so well. So um, he never really had a strong authorial role in the team, as far as I see it. So, um, And about the Latin American diaspora in, in Paris, there are many people who can answer that better than I can. I, I, I just don't really know what, uh, either I'm not understanding the question or, or else I just don't know. So if you want to explain more about what you're asking, that might be. Well, more than anything else, it's a doubt that I have. Because in the first editions of the Havana Biennale, there's uh, one award, if I'm not mistaken. One of the awards was uh, financed by the Latin American gallery that was uh, located in Paris. No, sorry. No, the uh, the Latin American gallery space, I think it was called. And I know that Paris was a, a very important uh, place for the first uh, Biennale. And I know that they sent uh, quite a few works to that first uh, Biennale. And then I was always thinking about uh, Julio Leparco, I think she said, who was uh, also involved in the second uh, Biennale, if I'm not mistaken, with a workshop. So this is why I was thinking about this question. Do, was there any, any relationship there? So was, um, this is, I'm thinking aloud, really, more than anything else. And these are the things that are in my mind. So especially, you're right, Le Parc did, um, did an open-air workshop in, in a park um, in 1986. I think he did one in 84 as well. Um, what, what's interesting to understand about how the, um, how the Biennale was um, populated, especially the first time around, I mean, basically, what happens is Wifredo Lam dies in 83, I think, or maybe 82. Fidel Castro goes um, to, I can't remember who, someone in the cultural machinery and says, you're going to start a contemporary art center dedicated to Wifredo Lam, and that center is going to produce a biennial, which will be parallel to the cinema festival and the jazz festival and whatever. Um, and the next year it's made to appear um, with no resources, no, no staff, no building, no budget, um, and no, um, n what was at the time quaintly referred to as a Rolodex, which means names of people that they knew who they could call and say, will you show your work here? What they had was um, Casa de las Americas, which had been running a visual arts program since 1959, and which had um, networks of contacts, contacts throughout Latin America. Those networks um, were both located in country and in exile, because this is the mid-'80s. There were a tremendous number of Latin American artists and intellectuals living in Paris and elsewhere in exile. Um, so, especially in 84 and 86, the way that the artist roster was put together was through this network of um, leftist and, in some cases, revolutionary 
cultural um, contacts. Um, and whether, so it, it was as much a political network as an aesthetic network, as, as much um, a political network as an aesthetic process, I could say. Um, that only began to change in 1989 um, when the curatorial process was quite different and there was actual curatorial travel and research um, in various regions. But again, that was somewhat constrained by, the, by a very pragmatic and logistical set of considerations. Namely, um, so Mosquera tells these extraordinary stories. He was the curator for Africa, for Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, he was able to travel wherever Cuba had an embassy, but nowhere that it didn't have an embassy. He was able to cross borders where Cuba had relations on both sides of the border, but not where it didn't. Um, so there are multiple maps that have to do with exile, with emigration, with historical patterns of avant-garde presence in, in places like Paris, um, with which embassy has the money or has a car that works. These are all factors in the curatorial process. I hope that answers a little bit. Yes. This is a very quick comment for you. Thank you very much uh, to Rachel. Many thanks for your presentation. I would just like to remind you that the Havana Biennale, in a way, is the con continuation of what they did in the 60s with other, with other media. So as Rachel pointed out, the, there was a very harsh Soviet influence in the 70s in Cuba. And they abandoned the so-called Cuban uh, pathway. So the revolution was neither Soviet, Soviet it was, uh, nor was it Latin American. This was interrupted after the death of Che Guevara, as from the 70s this was interrupted in a very harsh manner and in a very sudden manner. And La Casa de las Américas in the 60s, what it was for intellectuality of the third world in Latin America, well, let's say that this is what the contemporary arts and the visual arts uh, were like in the Havana Biennale in 1980. So in other words, it was going back to the nostalgia of uh, socialism, which was not going to be the Soviet option, and then um, continue it, give it continuity based on the visual arts. And Mosquera was thinking about a journal that was called Tres Mundos, that was triangular between Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And I believe that that was also very important because uh, there was a strike. And well, you can see this in the pictures of that. And, and this um, was recovered by the Reina Sofia three or four years ago. And I think that this is something that has to be clarified because it's uh, it's about going back to the original spirit of the 60s, uh, of the revolution, but incorporating this to the multicultural discourse of the 80s. And, uh, well, in spite of the repression and so on and so forth, they did have an alibi, the Cuban government did have an alibi to continue with that, uh, that uh, third level um, biennial. So they could afford to be anti-Soviet because, as Rachel pointed out, well, Fidel Castro was not going to continue the path of perestroika. So what could you do? Well, the only thing you could do is go back to that truncated pathway that had been abandoned in the late 60s and recover it because he knew that the, com the country was going to be on its own, that it wasn't going to be supported by the Soviet Union. And it didn't want to have anything related to democracy, which is what Gorbachev suggested. He didn't want to go for that. And this allowed him to have a certain amount of cultural power in the third world, in the periphery, in all the debates that were taking place at that point in time. But we have to understand the connection with the 60s too, the connection that the Biennale had. Yeah, the, thank you. The only thing I'll say is that I would, I would push the point of reference even further back, which is why I showed you the Marti. So, thank you.
Buenas tardes. Eh, muchas gracias. Por... Well, thank you very much uh, for coming. Thank you to the girls from Bolegua for inviting me uh, to this conference, and thank you for the uh, to the Kuna Center for uh, organizing these uh, two days. Well, I just would like to say that we were funded in 1982, uh, soon after Spain joined the NATO. So the joining into this uh, military uh, alliance and the defeat of the referendum meant uh, that was the end uh, of the non-agree political reform. The transition was uh, considered over and consolidated according to what Amanda Fernandez Salvatore said. A political order, symbolic aesthetic order was consolidated and was uh, managed by uh, the gaze of the action. So the uh, political parties and the uh, trade unions and the media and the communication would articulate all this. The fact that the no lost the referendum meant that the end of the uh, against uh, a NATO movement, that it was a popular movement, self-organized, and uh, not very much remembered today that activated millions of uh, uh, minds that were uh, resistant minds, and that meant that the uh, defeat uh, spread with disenchantment. So after this defeat, Miguel Belloc and myself, we were an active part of this movement. And uh, we decided our political militants was also over because it was articulated around the communist movement and the uh, trade union. I was a uh, building a lawyer at the time, but also at the end of the neighbor fight and the gay movement. And we started working in what we uh, would call the uh, cultural production. And then we were funded as a company in 1982. We started working in contemporary art in 1991 when we did our first project with Marvi Espesa, and we call it the uh, Sueño Imperativo. We met Mar after she had spent some years in New in uh, the States, when she was already a well-known uh, art uh, curator, and uh, she had already been uh, working for the uh, Figura International magazine, and she was the co-founder of the magazine Arena. These were the years when the uh, art and culture were turning into a show, and that is the case up until the present uh, times, and when the institutional critique uh, was finally assumed by the museum and the market. So also uh, in those years, different uh, political and artistic practices happened, and Mark did know them uh, first uh, hand. So simply said, she was a well-formed and informed uh, person, something that was exceptional at the time time in Spain, and therefore she was able to make the right diagnosis of the uh, artistic community in our country. This situation mainly was about the uh, government uh, leading the uh, scene, and uh, it was a very uh, little influence of the uh, market. We met then when she as art critique and as a political activist, we started to question the production process and the cultural policies that were organized as a self-measure 
about the creation of new, based only on the creation of new uh, buildings. So in 1987, Arte Lego was built. In 1988, uh, the Reina Sofia Museum was opened. In 1989, the IVAN, the Atlantic uh, Center of Modern Art and the um, Contemporary Art Galician Center. In 1995, the Andalus uh, Center of Contemporary Art and the Mayac. And in 1998, the Macbeth and then the uh, new ones uh, like Museum in uh, Vigo, Castilla, León, Valladolid, Visteria Castellet, Palma de Mallorca, Granada, and many others. And then the cherry on this, uh, to this cake was the museum, uh, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao that opened in 1997. So we started working in 1990 in Seville where the impact of the contemporary art market was always known as existent. But at the end of the 80s, then there is a reconstruction of the artistic tissue that marked the uh, panorama at the time in Spain. So we had galleries like La Máquina Española or Juana de Izpuru, or magazines like Figura, Figura Internacional, and Arena. Then this was... Uh, uh, possible due to difficult institutional, political, and economical uh, features. And then we got different authors and creators that were in uh, almost a uh, very tough situation and decided to organize radical uh, artistic projects. When, by the time the uh, Junta de Andalucía decided to support uh, these artists, then this uh, lost momentum. El Sueño Imperativo was uh, created in 1991 to confirm these experiences and to react to those political. It was funded by PSV, the uh, building cooperative by the UGT, and by IGS, and it was presented at the uh, headquarters of the CCBBAA of Madrid. So it was uh, uh, wholly funded uh, with private uh, money, and it was opened in a site that was not a museum or any of the new institutional centers. As a paradox, the uh, PSV cooperative uh, was uh, the uh, main actor of the main uh, corruption scandal that so far now uh, had turned into common uh, currency in this country. So the cooperative and the uh, management company of it, with more than uh, 20,000 cooperative members that contributed with 38 million pesetas at the time went into a uh, suspension of payments. So the OGTT uh, trade union had to take on board the project and then they, the manager of this uh, system ended up in jail. After five uh, months in jail, uh, this man Soto decided to explain that the managers of uh, UGT, the trade union, uh, knew about this operation. Nicolas Redondat, he left this uh, general secretariat, and according to Soto, he knew that uh, the trade union will get 100,000 uh, pesetas for every new member, but the trade unions would always uh, reject these accusations. No matter how it was, the paradox is there. And that exhibition that soon became one of the benchmarks to study the relationships in between uh, politics and art in Spain. And uh, that uh, sort of was for us uh, a way to uh, do research in uh, cultural and political activities. This was funded by the trade union that uh, two years later led to one of the big, big frauds in democracy. This seems like a joke, but this is what it was at the time, and that exhibition was quite important nevertheless. And we want to uh, say this is different to Plus Alter that was uh, wholly funded by a public institution, but especially because this uh, is an example of the uh, complex plots that were happening at the beginning of the socialist government. As Teresa Villaros uh, uh, mentioned, this was the uh, socio-economical supplantation and some symbolic one with the Movida Madrileña, the new con cultural consumption boom, and this was sort of hang kind of uh, 
trying to compensate for the dark uh, years of the dictatorship. So back to the exhibition, if it's in the catalog, Marby Espesa affirms that after the uh, isolation of the um, Spanish art uh, during the 40 years of the Franco regime, the dilemma was to, to see how we could make the society and the culture in Spain face common issues for the globalized society that were new to us. So how the the Spanish artist uh, that has no tools like a genealogy and a minimum critical context will be able to face the sociopolitical contradictions and economical and cultural ones uh, that face uh, their uh, European colleagues without uh, falling into harmless aestheticisms. The El Sueño Imperativo suggested to debate uh, these uh, matters with 11 artists, six Spanish artists and five foreign ones, most of them from North America or based in New York. Only two of them were uh, women. The artists were invited to create uh, a piece of work on the spot and a text for the catalogue. And they could make use of uh, public and private spaces of the uh, CCBBAA. For the curator, the circle, uh, the circular of uh, fine arts, this institution uh, was site-specific per se, and every piece of work will should have a dialogue with its own language and with the institution and with the representation of the culture. I will. Shall I review the whole of the work uh, quickly? Well, with the text of Mar and the text of written by Mar, we will uh, quickly review the whole uh, exhibition. Nancy Espero. She chose uh, to locate uh, in the balcony, in the terrace, uh, and the coffee shop uh, of the building uh, her work. There you have the piece of uh, work uh, with uh, the Greek civilization, Hittite, uh, athletes. Uh, Reside in front, the top of the building, the city. There was a beautiful text uh, titled The uh, Mujer como Protagonista, Women as Main uh, Actor. The room Minerva in the basement was one chosen by Frances Abac to uh, display a work that uh, talked about the power of media on the contemporary perception. La Cabeza de la Medusa was the title of the text. And uh, here's enough, uh, this, uh, here we see the head of a Medusa cut by Perseus. Juan Luis Maraza created what he called the settlement in the uh, Sala de Juntas, the garden room. And uh, in uh, Sumisia Revolución and Itacera Villa, he uh, questions how could we uh, set some distance that seems necessary to observe the relationship in between the artist and the society. Anyway, he says, I don't feel this as two willing fragments of uh, tranquil uh, uh, synthesis, but rather than ne like necessary ingredients of this uh, melting pot that we call knowledge. Pedro Gerromeno chose the chairman's uh, cabinet and the library and the uh, hall glass windows, the lift and the cafeteria. Quinta Columna was the name of his text where he said, is there a social artist or this is a name that only hide uh, preachers? Are all artists social or those who raise their hand as an exception are on the uh, edges of the society? Dori Berkovich uh, created a space uh, and on the walls of this uh, room, there was a, a critical vision of the American uh, uh, society model. He questions the state of Israel. And uh, in the text, uh, Life Without Freedom, he shows what he, uh, the footage he made a year uh, before in Palestine. 
Bihorho Kobo. He used the uh, column of room of the circle to talk about uh, things like history, memory, destination, or amnesia. Swiftness turns history into a simple uh, repertoire of funerals, of celebrations. History, as every other capital, is such because it grows. Chris Barden was the only artist that didn't produce a work for the exhibition or wrote for the catalog. Samson was uh, his work that was hosted in the hall, in the lobby. The difficulties of the installation and also uh, the fact that members of the institution uh, were quite reluctant to have it. And finally, it was not on display. A huge imperial staircase was the location for uh, Kevin Carter's uh, uh, work. He's attracted by neoclassical sculptures, Apollo, Minerva, Diana, and uh, he wrote a text called Nothing Else, Nada Mas, for the catalogue. Also, the staircase that uh, the uh, foundation of the uh, void inside the staircase, Samus Lawson dropped a piece of a sculpture that would sort of sink in the floor. And this was his homage to the fallen angel, Angel Caída, and it was installed in the Retiro Park in Madrid. Visiones Angelicas was the title of his text where he talks about how the vision of a monument and the interest to decode uh, its uh, meaning sort of took him to reread the uh, lost uh, paradise and to retrieve the fallen angel as a figure because it brings the hope for a change and the enlightenment against the authority uh, power of a definitive authority. Rogelio Lopez Cuenca expanded the space of the exhibition to the street. A street of uh, billboards uh, talk about the new events coming in 1992. Uh, in his text, uh, Sous, les Paves, Sous les Pavés, there is the following quotation. Currently, no language escapes uh, the uh, bourgeois ideology. The only possible uh, response is only uh, the theft. Fragmenting ancient uh, text of culture, of science and literature, and disseminate its uh, pieces with uh, non-recognizable uh, formulas. Formula. And I would like to conclude by talking about Christoph Wudicke that projected his uh, work on the Arc of uh, Victory in Madrid, uh, the Arc of uh, Triumph that was made in between 1950 and 1956 to celebrate the victory of those uh, that made the coup d'etat. But it modified the initial project with a leg stomping, stomping a rose, uh, clearly uh, meaning the logotype of the PSOE, the Spanish Socialist party. And this led to the uh, Iraqi army to withdraw from uh, Kuwait uh, three uh, days uh, before. In his text, uh, he says that the main function of the architectonical structures uh, is uh, to remain uh, still always rooted in on the terrain to counterbalance what we artists have to do, that is to act on the city uh, plots. Then Frances Torex uh, launched uh, 35 uh, questions through the radio, the press, and the TV, and the answers were published in the newspaper El Sol. Vuelo Rasante was uh, the title of his text, and there he uh, said that uh, nowadays we can say that art in general is just a mere reflection of the uh, dominant culture. There is no will to change anything. Whenever there is something new, this happens on, only in the field of uh, the skin of the epidermis. So nothing should be excluded from the origin. A cultural project will not have an impact on the, the current uh, situation. This is why it is very difficult to assess how or what is the impact of this imperative. But it was very successful from the very beginning, though. 
What we can uh, affirm is that uh, even though this is quite contradictory and naive, in a framework that is depolitized, the Sueña uh, Imperativo sort of uh, mentioned some question that even sometimes didn't get an answer, sort of uh, uh, were a way to sort of shake up uh, the uh, art uh, scenario at the time, how to identify some of the features that constitute the political art and some of the tales that sort of go against this kind of art. Is it possible to save the relationship and the conflict that usually happen in between political practices and aesthetic uh, practices? How to buffer this confrontation by redirecting a debate towards a new debate where the connection or the link uh, with uh, politicians will help us sort of uh, get deeper into these uh, issues or debates. These are some of the questions that the exhibition sort of uh, made to a group of artists that at the time always wanted to oversee the situation and move from a dictatorship a period where Spain was fully isolated into democracy. For BMW, BNV, we were in between the rest of uh, the, we were in between the remains of the wreck of the Franco period and we are now moving into something that was changing our subject subjectivity and was sort of uh, setting some distance from the new, with the new political model. We wanted, were wondering what art was uh, producing at the time. And we've been trying to understand uh, s since then. So this is why, thanks to this revelation that we uh, had with uh, our second uh, project uh, in the Sueño Revelativo, we started Plus Ultra project. In 1991, in March, the uh, Andalusia Pavilion of the Expo 92, they are called upon us, BNV, to present a project of contemporary art for the Universal Exhibition. We propose Marvie Spesa to accept uh, this uh, order, if this uh, commissioning, if uh, we were sort of uh, tackle this from a perspective that would sort of uh, consider this celebration and also as if it would take place in the Cartuja Island, a space devoted to the celebration of the discovery, El Descubrimiento of America. So, Tierra de Nadie, co-curated by Jose Lebrero and Jack uh, y Americas, co-curated by Berta Sichel. And the proposal was also finished, or had also another proposal, El Artista de la Ciudad, Plus Ultra. Was fully funded by the Andalusian Pavilion that depends on the uh, Ministry of the Presidency of the Andalusian uh, government. So it was organized and funded by a public body in a moment where there is a displacement of uh, a swift that happens in the institutional critique, not only in the time and history, but also sort of uh, shifting from inside uh, towards the outside, as uh, Simon Shekha said. So the institutional critique that took place at the end of the 70, 60s and beginning of the 70s was done mainly by artists and against the uh, artistical institutions, the new uh, debates uh, were done by uh, the directors of the museums, curators and uh, head of programs in the different museums and art uh, institutions. So, as a Sheikh says, the institutional structures now are completely interiorized. 
so far that Andrea Feso says that we are now the institution. If this is the case, then it will be about uh, creating critical institutions based in the self-questioning and self-reflection. Institution is no longer an issue or a problem, but a solution. And this is what Miguel and myself, uh, we believed when we accepted the Plus Ultra, Plus Ultra uh, project, because we said, from one of these uh, places where this event was happening, we were going to uh, set a critical project. This was not easy. This led to lots of uh, negotiations, bargaining, and even if we, uh, it was as often, it was said it was going to be cancelled. But of course, we cannot uh, consider that uh, we really knew the new uh, formula that were being adopted by the institutional critique, uh, because we only got to know that uh, later on. So the management of the production happened in a contingent way, and it responded to the ways in which we act. Maybe we were, because we were very militant, uh, we were quite uh, used to working with institutions. Nevertheless, even though we made a big effort, even if we explore new ways, even we are uh, very critical, every uh, process of institutionalization uh, creates an exclusion. And this was the uh, case with the Andalusian Pavilion and also the Plus Ultra project, because some voices were neglected because they were uh, clearly against uh, these events of uh, 1992. What I would like to underscore is that these exclusions or these absences, if you want to be more malevolent in how you call them, were not so from our awareness of how impossible it was for the institution to give visibility to those resistances that were facing the event in a radical manner. And uh, we also uh, disagreed with the work that was being done within and without the institutions. But we needed to consolidate a newly born entrepreneurial project, and we had to protect our immediate interests. But the incredible thing is that this exclusion was based on a lack of knowledge, a lack of knowledge that showed that there was a tremendous gap between the artistic community and certain political practices, especially, th especially those that had been carried out by bodies that were not political parties and that were using innovative um, struggle methods. And this situation of ignorance could not be justified uh, based on the irrelevance or the invisibility of these movements because the, the lock-in in, in the cathedral and the two demonstrations on April the 19th and 20th of 1992 were very significant because uh, after the police intervened, uh, three people were um, injured, 84 were arrested, and 42 were um, expelled. And, and it's important to stress that some of these events happened on the day that the expo was inaugurated. And whilst the police were repressing people by beating them with their batons, on the other side of the river, there was a very large uh, representation of the artistic community that was visiting the exhibition Pasajes Actualidad del Arte Español and the works installed outdoors in the Feria Universal. As regards Plus Ultra, the question would be, how can you understand that a project that considers a critical reflection on the celebration of the conquest and the political cultures that were behind the investments, how, could, uh, it, uh, didn't, how come it did not take into account the associations and actions and manifestos as those deployed by the Desenmascaremos el 92 platform? And how could it be that none of the Spanish artists invited to Plus Ultra, nor the people that uh, attended the many workshops, how is it that they didn't include the protests that were taking place? Or how come they didn't uh, draw people's attention to their existence? Why was it there was a, such a big gap? And why was there a lack of interest between the struggle in the streets and the critiques uh, that uh, were being launched against the event? 
Well, we've said that one of the possible causes has to do with the integration and exclusion effects produced by what happened after the second wave institutional criticism, as uh, which is the term that Simon Sheik used. In other words, finding new places from which uh, resistance could be brought, and uh, our political position that consists in deploying our work in the gap opened by the institutions as we drill holes to produce movements in the structures of power, which is what Miguel said. So we can talk about these and many other reasons, but we believe that the cause is that, well, that uh, can contextualize the peculiarity of this case was the success, well, the, uh, of what nearly 20 years later is still called the regime of the transition. And going back again to uh, Amador Fernandez Sabater, we can define as uh, the consensus in relation to an idea of a democracy that is representative, liberal, and moderate, which is the only antidote you can use against uh, ideological and social polarization. So this uh, regime that uh, was successful in uh, the 85-86 uh, biennial, and uh, which was symbolically consolidated in 1992 with the Olympic Games and the Universal Exhibition, delivered a monopoly and uh, defined the framework of what is possible and uh, stated who can speak where and from where. So this monopoly was so strong that it affected all of us, and nearly two decades had to go by for it to crack and break. The anti-92 positions were devastated and they disappeared very quickly too. And they only appeared 10 years later with the UNIA anti-thought program and the Desacuerdo project that recovered part of its memory and part of its archive, archives. Plus Ultra had a reasonable uh, budget. And that was uh, something like 600,000 euros, which allowed us, on the one hand, to form a production team formed by five people, among which was Alicia Pinteño, with whom we worked until now. And we also had um, financial and uh, human means, uh, more than enough financial and uh, human means. So. This uh, brought about eight interventions and three thematic exhibitions, and each one of the interventions that were proposed were autonomous, and uh, they were also a fragment of an itinerary that you could uh, cover and uh, reveal the discourse of the project, which, according to the curatorial text, had to do with the limits of whatever was peripheral. And Mar in talks about a dispersion in space and time that represents the denial of center as a response to the power that is imposed as a totality. And the title of the Plus Ultra project that became the um, motto of Charles V was uh, taken on board because it pointed out an ambivalence, because on the one hand it's imperialist use that the Universal Exhibition was also doing, and on the other hand because there was a literal meaning, it says, beyond which we believe would allow us to go beyond this uh, commitment and also explore, and I would like to quote Mart, so that we could explore the physical, cultural and economic limits as well as the culture of our diaspora, of exile and the battle of the frontiers that Apollinet uh, spoke about. So the first intervention took place at the Church of San Luis de los Franceses in Seville, built between 1699 and 1731. It is one of the richest monuments, and it's uh, very complex, iconographically speaking, and it's also very sumptuous. Francis Torres carried out a project that was based on the figure of Christopher Columbus to represent the contradiction between the compulsive wish to control the world and the impossibility of controlling history. Well, we have um, texts of the artists that supplemented his proposals. And Soledad Sevilla carried out her intervention at the Bérez Blanco castle in the province of Almería. Built as from 1507, it's considered to be one of the most uh, peculiar um, works of uh, the Renaissance period in Spain. In 1904, its uh, yard was uh, dismantled and taken to France and uh, it was then eventually installed and can be seen at the Metropolitan Museum of New York. 
The proposal of the artist uh, was about uh, uh, setting up a projection in the in the yard to show the pictures of the work that had been taken to the Metropolitan Museum. The Agustin Parejo School Collective could not carry out their proposal because they were not given municipal permission. And this was supposed to be given by the Socialist Town Council of Malaga. And the project was uh, about um, acting on the monument to the Marquis of Larios of 1896 uh, that was made by Mariano Benyure. And uh, the Marquis obtained his fortune and his uh, title by exporting wine and by working in the sugar business. And during the Malaga revolts of 1931, the sculpture was thrown into the sea. And uh, now there's a statue that represents a labor and which was uh, used as a model for the bullfighter Mazantini. The uh, Barajo mm, proposed that this um, feat be repeated, but instead of throwing the statue into the sea, they decided to take it to the Ladio Street and the town council didn't give uh, the necessary permit uh, due to conservation issues. So the proposal was uh, documented at an exhibition that took place at the School of Architects in Malaga, with, uh, also with a merchandising and uh, with uh, posters that were pasted to the walls with a picture of the monument and with the legend Sin Larius. Adrian Piper carried out his intervention at the Monastery of Santa Clara de Moed in the province of Huelva. And this is one of the most outstanding architectural examples of the Mudejar style in Western Andalusia. And the American connection of this monastery started just before the first uh, Columbine trip. The abbess Ines de Enrique had an epistolary relationship with the Admiral and um, said mass on 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 March the 16th, 1493, when they came back from their first voyage. And the Adrian Piper proposal was um, was about uh, well, repeating the photograph of a Somalian mother with her child. And it was placed in the arts, arches of the gallery. And a soundtrack uh, reproduced the Luba Mass that was sung by the Mungano Choir of uh, Kenya. And at the Tower of the Santa Cruz in Cadiz, a um, cubic tower of 1689 that was built on the um, ramparts. That's where Alfredo Jad located his proposal. A selection of uh, poems by Rafael Alberti could be seen in neon lights and reflected on the surface of the water. And there was a soundtrack that uh, played uh, Noches en los de España by Manuel de Falla. Dennis Adams uh, carried out his proposal una vez at the market square in Uveda. It used to be called Plaza del Generalísimo in the province of Jaén. And Dennis Adams projected a kiosk of the blind man's uh, organization uh, where they sold uh, coupons. And at the kiosk, there were two big photographs that uh, showed the police that were controlling the crowd that were waiting to see General Franco to um, drive past Ubera, onto the National Organization of uh, Blind People, and uh, in English that means only once, um, served as a metaphor of the forgetfulness and blindness and that is the obscure side of things in uh, Spain in 1992. James Lee Bayer located his Esfera Dorada in the Palacio de los Cordoba in Granada once he had received um, permission to do so. Well, he was first um, refused to do so at the Palace of Carlos V, Charles V. And the Palacio de los Cordoba is a Renaissance building that is on the hills of the Alhambra in Albaicín and Sacramonte since 1893, and that is the year when it was uh, purchased by the town council, it's uh, where the municipal archives are, and the three-meter sphere was made by uh, craftsmen in plaster and covered with uh, golden, uh, golden sheets. And several uh, kings were buried there, among them Isabella Católica before she was uh, transferred to the cathedral, 
and on the day of the inauguration, Miguel Vignoc, and before the public entered the uh, venue, got inside to inside the sphere where from where he repeated the name Maria de Rao. And finally, the collective uh, comprising Fede Goodman, Victoria Gil, Robin Khan, and Kirby Cooking made the time capsule in Cordoba. In principle, it was supposed to be installed on the riverbanks of the Guadalquivir River. It, it could not be taken to that location because it didn't receive the permission, didn't receive permission from the town council. We never knew why they refused. Although it seems that as it was all about uh, building a time capsule um, that uh, you usually find at universal exhibitions, but this was supposed to be an open capsule that was a 25 meters long trench, um, meter and a half in depth and 80 centimeters in width covered by a grid and full of liquid asphalt. We believe that the town council believed that this new archaeological source that was being proposed was uh, only posed many, many problems. And it was uh, laughing at the municipality, the municipal authority, well, whatever. The, well, the work could not be done and had to be taken to the expo. And it was inaugurated at 8 o'clock in the morning on October the 12th after the Universal Exhibition was closed. America. America was one of the three thematic exhibitions uh, with more than 70 works uh, by American artists from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego. The conceptual framework of the project was based on the fact that the American continent did not only redefine geographic frontiers but also questioned the limits of existing knowledge. So Berta Sikil said that protagonism was given to the emergence of a vigorous secular culture in Italy and to the Protestant reform in Germany, and that the encounter with the New World was excluded from the list of key events that brought about the transition to the Renaissance period. And for the curator of the exhibition, she believed that Utopia by Thomas Moro, and the New Atlantic by Bacon, and the Third Solar by Campanella, that wouldn't have existed without the narrations of that other world with more than 25 centuries of history that had just been revealed. And the, ex the exhibition was presented at the Monastery of Santa Clara de Moguer. And, well, this um, said that there was a cultural and social spectre that was very diverse and stated there was a lack of validity in unified representations of the world. It's the best definition that could be made of contemporary world, said Cecil consists in incorporating the terms of heterodoxy, pluralism, eclecticism, revolt and deformation. Well, Las Americas, with its identities and cultures, is once again changing the concepts of society as it did in 1492. Tierra de Nadie, the other thematic exhibition that was created by José Lobrero, included works from more than 50 artists, most of them were European. And for Liberero, Tierra de Nadie well, was based on very reliable testimonies with images, objects, documents, and memories that exemplified moments of uh, a concept that is uh, am imprecise and ambiguous. And for Liberero, artistic thought that is uh, generated in the different regions of this dense and intricate um, place we call Europe can only be understood as a function of what happens beyond. And this is why artists like Onko Kowara, James Levias, or Nanju Paik were included. The exhibition was uh, presented at the Hospital Real de Granada, and uh, through it, Liberero says, and I'd like to quote him, that there could not only be only one North in European art, because throughout the 20th century, all of the cardinal points have been dismantled. This has produced a very um, positive encounters and cruel confrontations, and even less today when economic inequality and the exchange of uh, the speed of exchange of information will hybridize languages, uh, race, uh, rituals, and the myths of our continent. And finally, El Artista de la Ciudad presented the work of local artists or people that were working at Andalusia, with the exception of Montadas or Struchenbank. 
terminando, ¿no? Voy terminando. I'm finishing. Well, nearly 30 years have gone by since we um, held these three exhibitions. And uh, by delivering this presentation, I've uh, noticed that many things have changed, but that sometimes the continuous and sometimes frenetic movement uh, that we've been witnessing for these last 30 years has been useful in order to remain, to stay in the same place. We could say that it was fundamentally the two um, papers that we had in Plus Ultra and El Insuño Imperativo, and we inaugurated what we can define as our the way we do things. On the one hand, we have uh, well the understanding that the challenge of uh, progressive cultural policies is not based on having political um, programs, but rather it's based on forcing institutional structures and the hierarchies in such a manner that projects, programs and actions can be done in a political manner. On the other hand, this would be the second issue. And, uh, well, if uh, the option you have in terms of the institutional policy, well, this is what we've done on several occasions, well, even when you agree with the uh, Commission, we well, always have to do so in the deviated manner because it's only the insubordination that avoids the literality of the message and the duplication of the political discourse that provides you with a practical relationship between arts, art and politics. And that's all from me. Thank you very much. Hello. Well, firstly, I would like to thank you for all of those um, explanations. And um, secondly, out of curiosity, you've been mentioning quite a few exhibitions here in the lecture. And I think that the first one had to do with El Sueño Imperativo. There were less artists. And then after that, there were more in Plus Ultra. And for instance, in the case of uh, Plus Ultra, you spoke about 600,000 euros you had available in funding. But I'm afraid that I can't remember what you said before that. And uh, that is, well, just to underscore if those artists, uh, were they really based more on an altruistic spirit or was there a very sort of close uh, cooperation involved? Or how did that work out exactly? And uh, I would also like to know if in, well, in Plus Ultra, you, um, when you were criticizing this, and by the way, that was uh, very pertinent, very good, but that nothing was um, incorporated uh, from in this in Mascarando of 1992. And was there anything that you had to approach in that respect. And I would say I'd like to thank you for that last reflection too, because I am also, well, in the cultural system, we are on strike at uh, the Tabacalera, and sometimes it's very difficult for the artists to collaborate with um, uh, collectives that are small, like ours. And perhaps if we were to and receive the support of larger collectives, things would be much easier, of course. But anyway, the questions uh, were what I said before, and the rest of it was just remarks. Well, yes, so those two exhibitions were completely different in terms of format and funding, and I'm not sure, I'm not exactly sure about the, um, the budget of um, the, the Imperativo. That's why I didn't give the figure. But it's obviously clearly lower. I'd have to give you the figure in pesetas. And if Plus Ultra had a budget of 90 million pesetas, which is more or less the amount it had, I don't think that I don't, that Imperativo had more than 20 or 30 million pesetas, which d d doesn't mean that the artists were not paid, of course. Although the only thing is that the scope of the project and uh, the needs of that project were much less. 
El sueño imperativo was not, didn't have any kind of uh, conflictive framework involved when the time came to being presented. It was uh, rather the opposite because it had been uh, supported by a left-wing trade union and uh, it was um, presented at the Circle of Fine Arts in Madrid, which is a very outstanding venue. And uh, it uh, didn't have to um, be confronted with anything, but it was uh, very well received. It only had to deal with the problems that the institution posed, and they posed them many, but in any case, that's a completely different issue. Plus Ultra, well, yes, it was born in a context that was clearly controversial, and uh, that is the uh, Andalusia uh, Pavilion with the celebration of the discovery of America. But as we tried to avoid that, we left the, the exhibition, the universal exhibition. So in other words, he had no works on the island. And well, this uh, work was based on the number of monuments, which is what I more or less said in the presentation. But what, and it's, it's, um, I think that this would never happen nowadays. But this movement, this movement uh, that um, took place on the streets and uh, which was um, support by anarchists, but it was um, very significant because, well, there was lots of police re repression. And the level of repression was extremely high on the part of the police. And we it's not about incorporating, not incorporating anything, but it was not included in any of our debates. None of the Andalusian um, artists that came to these workshops um, even considered that, that uh, those uh, events had unfolded. So I think that there's um, this has to do with the monopoly of common sense. But how could this happen? Well, this can only be explained um, through the consolidation of the transition in 1992. How it imposed this, and it was uh, the conquest of absolute and total hegemony that happened at all levels, even at uh, other levels that were more critical.